Traveling the Vortex. We've joined the Doctor as he travels the Vortex and arrived at episode number 300, where we're all back from Time Eddie 2 and exhausted. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. How are you guys? Excited that we're at the episode number 300! Happy anniversary! Happy anniversary! <laughs> 300 episodes. Oh, how are you guys doing today? Oh, tired. Tired, tired. It was a busy weekend. It was a busy weekend. I'm, I'm actually not as tired, but I went home and took got a nap. half hour nap. So. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about what we did. Um, probably not for the whole week, but what we did this weekend, obviously, uh, here in a little bit. But uh, we're going to go ahead and skip ahead to some news. Because... There were some big announcements out of New York Comic Con. A Christmas title, guest star, and a quick look at a Christmas special. The Return of Dr. Mysterioso. What do you guys think of the the look and kind of the details we got? Stephen Moffat's out of ideas. That was my first impression. <laughs> it seems I, I I need reserve judgment, and I'll I'll say that right now. That's that's my mantra for this whole thing is. But when it, when you come out and say that hey next year's at, or this year's Christmas special is going to be with superheroes, and I think you feel like you're bandwagoning. You're really, really feel, late to the even, game. Even if he comes to... You're behind DC. Even if you come to <laughs> the... Well, <laughs> I suppose that's true. But you, I think you have to have a culmination of things. And you had to really wait till DC did their thing before... Uh, I know that you're doing that for the, the, for the, the humor for the of it. But, um, <laughs> because I don't really think that it, about this at all. <laughs> it really feels like bandwagoning to me. And like I say, I'm going to reserve judgment because it might be good. But... Um, that, that's just my initial impression. Stephen Moffat has run out of ideas. I'm going to reserve judgment till I see a proper trailer and, of course, the actual episode. I don't. I really can't form much of an opinion on the behind-the-scenes clip other than it looks like they're having fun and Matt Lucas is really giving Peter Capaldi a hard time. The, the I think the behind-the-scenes clip was, was enjoyable. It was funny to watch. And I think because it was behind-the-scenes and they had some cutting up and things like that. So Yes. Pretty much what you guys said. With the addendum that... I had to, to, to do some research because I thought, why? So I typed in Dr. Mysterioso. Or Myster- is it Mysterio or Mysterioso? Mysteri- oh, it was Mysterio. Mysterio. You're right, Mysterio. Dr. Mysterio, which like apparently, Mysterioso better. Is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's a thing yeah. that when Doctor Who would be shown in other countries, they would occasionally retitle it because it's not Doctor Who, and it would become Dr. Mysterio. Uh, to the point where in some countries it, they they just simply don't get it, so they cut a whole bunch of stuff out of it, like the plot. <laughs> and and there are people in these countries that believe that Doctor Mysterio is a program about a guy who lives in a magic apartment and has crazy neighbors. <laughs> That's what they've built the show up around. And so the fact that Moffat may be trolling that idea, I'm okay with that. Well, apparently, Peter, the superhero Peter, learned, Peter learned about the Doctor Mysterio when they went on the world tour to it, Latin it, it America, in Mexico, and, and yeah. he loved the name of it. So that's why <laughs> Moffat more chose it than anything else. I, I, I think it's I think it's fun. As far as the superhero angle, hero angle goes, it's a Christmas episode, so all bets are off. You know, it could be something serious. It could it could be not. Glenn could be right. Moffat may be out of ideas. It may be that it's the greatest thing we have yet to see. So. One of the things you it's have to be Doctor Who. One of the things you have to say in defense of it is Moffat's uh, Christmas specials have been just that specials. They've been they've been grand. They've been big. They've been fun. They've been a step aside from what is being done on the series proper. So given that, I think I'm a little more forgiving of going with this idea. It just seems the idea in general is a bit trite. <clears throat> If it was a season premiere, I'd agree with you. If it was just, oh, we're going to do superheroes on Doctor Who this year. Eh. <laughs> That's the, is that the American Horror Story theme? I, I don't get it, but <laughs> I don't watch American Horror Story. So. There's a lot about that I don't get. What else? What else? What else indeed? Well, speaking of Series 10, Moffat let slip at New York Comic Con that there is going to be a classic series writer coming back to write an episode for the new series for the Yay! first time since the show's returned who's left 
Terrence is still around. Terrence Dix is still around. <laughs> Who else is Andrew Cardinal. Well, there's Andrew a lot. Cardinal there's a lot from the latter around. run. Eric Sayward's uh, still Eric around. Eric Sayward. I don't think he'd ever do it, but um, Mark Platt's still around. Mark Platt. Oh, I'm calling it now. It's going to be Platt. <laughs> yeah, I bet it. I bet it's either Cartmel or Platt. Pip and Jane Baker. And no. I am. I well, am, one of them passed, didn't they? I think. I think. Yeah. Pip did. I am more Jane's inclined there, I think. to think that it will be uh, Platt. I think. Yeah, Mark Platt. I had forgot about that until you brought that up, Nucky. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. But um, that's exciting. Um, yeah. Have we had any classic series directors besides Graham uh, Harper? Graham Harper. Graham Williams. Graham Harper. Harper. Graham Harper. I'm not sure. Not that I'm aware of. So. Well, that will make now a classic writer and a classic director have done new series. So. Daniel on Twitter points out that all of the season's 26 writers are still alive. So. so there you go. Any one of them could come back. Who knows? I look forward to seeing who it is. Me too. Uh, another bit of news. Get, your, uh, get online and buy your tickets now. You can watch Power of the Daleks in U.S. cinemas. If your local theater is lucky enough to show the Fathom event, which Topeka and Lawrence are Yay! on the 14th of November, tickets are now on sale. We and that's ahead of the telecast. Keith, telecast is going to be on the 19th. Two days later, yeah. Um, Keith's um, hoping that he's on overnights. Because right? yeah. <laughs> I can't take off because that's during sweeps, but... If, if I'm on overnights, on like overnights, I kind of anticipate. Uh, to, uh, if you're on overnights, I yeah. want to go. <laughs> Glenn and I talked a little bit about that earlier today, and it's, I, I'm excited for it. I think it, it would be cool. Um, Glenn, not so much. And my argument is that, you know, while a season, you know, like something big like the 50th anniversary, Day of the Doctor, yeah, totally, in cinemas that's the way to do it, especially with the 3D angle. But um, going to see um, deep, Deep breath. deep breath was that the one they did, mm-hmm. uh, or in any season premiere? I kind of feel like, eh, you know, it's it, it, it's it, that's a TV thing for me. I don't, this is I, a special I, I, event, though. It's, this it's is such a big deal that they have animated it. That it should be that's, celebrated. That's it's a classic, and it's is, animated, yeah. and it's so that kind of all of a sudden has brought you know the expectations up a little bit more than my, just something that. Uh, let me uh, defend my response since. <clears throat> <laughs> You're just tampering your Sean, excitement because you Sean, won't be able to go in a minute. I think that's part of it. But Sean, Sean is making it sound like I think it's a bad idea. No, I think it's a great idea, and I'm excited for it. And I think that for all the reasons that Sean points out, it is a good one to be a theater event. I think it's my be a long show. I think my thing is it's if I had the the avail to go and the opportunity, yeah, absolutely. But I also look at price point is fifteen dollars for is something it, that I was I'm looking see, up to see the price. 15, well, roughly that's usually what Fathom events are for something I'll see two days later. And be able to download online for another probably ten dollars, eight to ten dollars. So I'm gonna. I just would be continuing to spend the money. And for me, the fifteen dollars isn't worth seeing it on the big screen when I can see it at home. Um, that being said, though, I think it's exciting, and I and I, I completely encourage them to continue to do these events that people want to go see and will do. Um, and it, if I was off that day, I probably would highly consider doing it. But it's. I guess my point is, I'm, I'm tempered by the fact that I'm working, so I don't. I'm not totally upset that i can't go see it you know it's not one of those things where <coughs> i think i'm sick that night you know <laughs> I, there are certain yeah. things where i think i entertain the notion of should i just pretend to be sick and go that's not one of them because of the avails that will be coming later with it so that's fair if i was working um it, well even a vintage in that capacity on that shift on that night knowing you know even even knowing that you know well it's different because i guess vintage i could have taken off for it but you know would i not having the obligation is a little different. Right. So, yeah. I can and see it, and that. It's the thing of if you have the extra twenty bucks to go to the theater. I don't, see. but <laughs> <laughs> it's really this tempting. Loser three. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice if you could use gift cards or things like that, but you can't even use yeah. gift cards or credits for uh, because it's a fathom because instead it's a fathom of a regal thing. Yeah. yeah. I just wonder if it makes it uh, um, if that's one of the things that the Beeb looks at on you know the bottom line when, I, when it comes back I would for think it well at least continuing to put them in theaters. Obviously, the other ones have been successful enough that this, this is what the fourth one they've done now. After this is the fourth now, fiftieth, the and then they did um, well. They did the fiftieth. I saw um, you saw Magician's Apprentice. Didn't I saw you? the no uh, the 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 the, la- the or the two, finale the finale. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, 
Death, Death in Heaven, Heaven Dark Water. Dark Water. Water. Yeah. Yeah. Dark Water Death. Dark Water Death. Yeah. yeah. I I went to see those. Uh, I actually I saw uh, Deep Breath in the cinema as well. So. And then one of the Christmas ones. <clears throat> Uh, wedding uh, husbands of River Song was in the theater, wasn't it? I think maybe it was. I think even. it was. I think it uh, maybe so. The there's night of. a lot, quite a few. There have been. I mean, it's it's obviously a successful event. They keep doing it. I think the other thing you have to consider is Fathom is a cheap delivery system for for theaters. Even I mean, it's got a high price point. And they make a lot of money on it. But that is something that comes over when it's a one time event. It the theaters are already equipped with a system that brings that in live streaming essentially into the theater. So it costs theaters virtually no money to sponsor those kind of things all they have to do is create a spot for it in a theater and so it, it's it's really a good cash grab for the bbc for fathom events for those kind of things because they spend very little and the overhead is great and i'm not i'm not saying that negatively i'm not putting that down because as long as people have the money to spend to go do that all power to them oh yeah um uh, well, and that's too that's high why for, it's too high can... of a price point for me sometimes but for other people, that's 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 a, wor- a worthy. 15 and that's bucks. why they can show the debates for free. Yeah, exactly. It's this kind of thing. Um, Fathom's got a good thing going as far as making money on on people that are that are willing to go see things in the theater, and it, the, it it's very cost effective for the theaters that that. So, and, and it's great for those places that don't have Alamo Draft Houses or other places that will show some of the older stuff, Correct. or special events. Correct. Our last bit of news comes from some local conventions that had some pretty big guest announcements this uh, weekend. Smallville Comic Con, which is going to be June 24th and 25th of next year, is going to have in Julian... In Hutchinson, Kansas. In Hutchinson, Kansas, is going to have Julian Glover. So those which, of you disappointed who were who, that he had to cancel for Kansas City Comic Con, make your plans now and get down to Hutchinson. I'm excited, because I would have gone to Kansas City Comic Con had uh, he not canceled. So I will be now making my plans to go to Smallville Comic Con. Absolutely. Especially now that there's not going to be a time any next year. That right. We, we Which can, uh, is a great selling point to my wife. For Smallville, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Guess what? I can go to Smallville because I, I didn't go to Smallville this year and went to Time Eddie. Next year I could say, well, bad news is I'm going to Smallville. The good news is I'm not going to Time Eddie. <laughs> And well, we've then, mentioned why, right? That there, there's just there, there, no, yeah, don't panic. We, we, they're we, just we taking a year it. off. So yes. <laughs> and welcome to anybody who found us from Time Eddie this yes. weekend. We'll get to talking about you in a minute. <laughs> uh, and then here locally in Topeka, TopCon for September twenty sixth or for twenty sixth, sixteenth and seventeenth of this sh- next year. Of which month? September. September. Okay. <laughs> the month that he said. <laughs> he probably did. I didn't hear it. Deep Roy is going to be here. Where's that convention at? Top no, I'm Con. just kidding. <laughs> Topeka, Kansas? No, I, you did say Topeka. I did say here in Topeka. <laughs> Who's Deep Roy, Keith? Deep Roy, for the Whovians, is Mr. Sin. What's Mr. Sin, Keith? No. In Talons of Wing Chang. <laughs> I feel like we're having to draw this stuff out of you. What's going on here? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he has been in a plethora of other stuff, including Star Wars, Star Trek... Um, Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. Willy Wonka the Chocolate Factory. Wonka no, Choc- he no. was not in Charlie Charlie and the Chocolate, Chocolate Factory. Factory. Pardon me, I stand corrected. Tim I caught Burton's myself in the stream. Tim the Apes, Big, fi- uh, Big Fish, I almost said Big Finish, uh, Return to Oz, Never Ending Story. So you probably rec- know him even if you don't know the name. Yeah. So go look him up and then come to Topeka to meet him. I am so jazzed. Because <laughs> he's been... Uh, scheduled for several other conventions you had gone to and had to cancel yeah. every time. Yep, yeah, it's been a series of near misses. So, and he's getting a montage. <laughs> <laughs> How do I pick one of those fandoms and have him sign that? There's Come on, a lot of choices to try to make. I'd go broke. <laughs> Can you sign this picture from Flash Gordon? Can you sign this picture from? <laughs> yeah. Moving on to feedback, Brittany sent in some feedback saying, insert some witty title here. Here is a quick note, little note to wish you guys a happy 300th anniversary. That is a lot of episodes, and that's not even counting your side trips. I know I have been quite a uh, quiet fan lately, but 
uh, going to blame work on that, but I have been enjoying all of your episodes. I wish I had the time to, and money to read all the books and comics and listen to all the Big Finish stories, but your reviews are the best, next best thing for now. I'm also enjoying your accounts of the cons you've all been to lately. Your interview with Spencer Wilding is one of my all-time favorite interviews you guys have done. Anyway, keep up the great work. Can't wait to hear about your next your about your adventures at Time Eddy Two and all the things you three have planned in the future. Until next time, your friend Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Brittany. Good to hear from you. She's got a good point. We've actually released three hundred and twenty four things of content <laughs> because if you count the twenty four side trips. Well that's done. more than that because there's the galley reports. There are the galley that reports that weren't side trip yeah. counted. Because Sean has done at least well, galley reports at least three times. I was involved in one of those. Yeah. Well, you, and there were multiple galley reports those multiple, times. Yeah. That's why I said three times. Because, <laughs> the, yeah, some years we had one or two, and some years we had one year. We, 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 five or six. we may have to recalculate. <laughs> we're reaching the 350 mark as far as content <laughs> goes. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed uh, the Spencer uh, interview, Brittany. That was, I, yeah. I think, I think one of our favorite ones too. He was yeah, such a joy to talk to. He was a really nice guy. And shameless plug for our YouTube channel: if you haven't seen it yet, there is a video of the uh, the panel that's different from the interview that we released on the podcast. It's a yes. completely separate recorded uh, instance. So we technically talked to him twice, and there are portions of both of them up there for you to enjoy. If you liked one, go check out the other. Uh, if you want to send us feedback, feel free. Uh, you can send it to feedback at Traveling the Vortex or just go to our website, travelingthevortex.com, and fill out the Send Us Feedback tab. So, Time Eddie. Time Eddie? What's that? This convention, <laughs> I at least I took part in. I don't know where Glenn was. <laughs> it was all a blur. It's all it kind of is. Here's the amazing thing about it. He was outside about... most of it, I think. It seems <laughs> like every time I turned around, he was gone. Here's the amazing thing about it is I left uh, Saturday morning at 7 a.m. <laughs> to make sure I got there for our first panel. And it seems like just hours ago that I left to go to this thing. I mean, that's how much fun and how time flew this weekend. We left Friday night, and it felt like just hours ago that we left to go to the thing, too. We also left Friday night, and um, uh, maybe a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are absolutely right. It's, it's so much fun, and it's such a great environment and such a good feel. And I, I certainly mean no offense to Planet Comic Con or any of the bigger cons that we've been to, um, I like the the more intimate feel of of Time Eddie. It feels like Galley before thirty seven thousand people showed up. <laughs> it's only thirty two hundred, but it sure feels like thirty seven thousand. Um, you know, being able to interact with the stars and you know all being centrally located and just it's just a joy. I, I think that, that I agree. I mean, and Planet Comic Con has its own charm in the sense that it has a little something for everyone. And I think in that aspect, it has to be the big con that it is. It yeah. has to be that draw. It has to be as big as it is. When you drill it down to one particular genre, which is Doctor Who, and one specific interest, it's nice to have that intimate con because you have a lot more availability with the guests, with the panels, with the vendors, with the actors, with everybody that's there, the cosplayers even. I think I interacted with more cosplayers this weekend. <laughs> I, you wouldn't think it from the pictures I took, but I interacted with more cosplayers this weekend than I have at any con I've ever gone to. And mostly because they have something of a common interest with me because they're dressed as Doctor Who characters. And those are you have to search those out at the big cons. Yeah. Here, they're everywhere. And so you have that more, um, everybody has kind of the same, they're in the same frame of mind and mindset. And so I think people are a lot friendlier to each other. You always have something you can strike up a conversation with somebody they're about. They're all about the same passion. I talk to more people at this one, uh, just the average people, than I have at any other con that I've gone to before. And it has to do with that common interest. So, and it's an impressive thing for you especially. Yeah, cause because I'm not a you're not person. a... <laughs> I'm not a walk up and just start a conversation. I was outside. And, <laughs> yes, I was. I was outside. <laughs> and there were a couple of guys out there that were chatting about. Uh, that we Actually, we had just left the Peter Davison panel. And they were talking about how they were new. They were talking to each other. And they were talking about they were new uh, Who series uh, watchers. And they had come to New Who. And one of the guys said, you know, I've always tried to go back and watch the classic series. But I get you know into it so far, and then I just kind of get bored or fall off. And I said, "Can I make a suggestion?" I mean, just interjected in the conversation. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion? And he said, "Yeah." And he said, "A lot of people 
actually can they 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 go back and i think they the biggest fault is they go back and they try to watch these things as a story as opposed to trying them in small pieces and i said if you want to go back and do a rewatch one of the, the most successful things is to go back and watch them 20 minutes at a time as they were meant to air as i said sometimes you have those particular stories that might be four to six parts and they're four to six parts because they're trying to fill time and I said, so you get a lot of padding, and sometimes it gets drawn down, and you get bored. And if you're trying to watch six 20-minute episodes in one setting, it can be very daunting. And so I suggested to him, and he actually said, oh, that's a wonderful idea. I think what I'll do is I'll do that. So he's actually now, because of my encouraging, he's going to go back to square one again, because he, he had tried to watch uh, Unearthly Child. And he said, I really like the first one, but I'm like, well, that's common. So <laughs> that's the problem with Unearthly he's going to try that and I, it was just, it's just that kind of thing where you yeah. feel like you know you could just start to strike up a conversation with somebody and so it was really refreshing it's one of those intimate cons there's two types of conventions in my mind there are cons like this and there are cons like Planet Comic Con or San Diego or New York or any of the Wizard Worlds and you go for two specific reasons you go to this type of con because you want to be around your people and interact with the celebrities in a more intimate way. You go to the other con to stand in line and get autographs. <laughs> or walk the vendor for and spend a bunch of money. This is for the experience more than anything else. I would agree with that. This is a certainly more like the Doctor Who conventions in the U.S. back in the day. And unfortunately for Sean and I, based in our locale, there wasn't a lot of the, that happening here. Yeah. You had to be in the bigger cities. You had to be in Chicago. You had to be in L.A. You had to be in New York. You had to be in some of the larger towns. <clears throat> but from all of the things that I've read or researched or learned about the conventions, this is what they've always been. And so it's also nice to step into something that I missed as an experience in the 1980s and 1990s. And it's nice to step into that experience and be able to kind of on a, on some sort of level experience what they experienced back then and it feels like even the participants the attendees meaning the the guests and the celebrities that they, come they, they seem more appreciative of the people who come to they the certainly do and i think that that is the kind of thing that that appealed to them when they were coming over here in the late 80s and early 90s is it was that type of convention it wasn't the big grand scales that they sometimes find themselves at and maybe are a little overwhelmed and so i think they're more willing to come to these kind of conventions because it is a one-on-one -on -one thing with individuals and they can talk and people love to hear their stories and these guys feel like they're people that can sit and tell their stories over and over and over again because it's new to a whole bunch of different people yeah. every time that they talk about it, so well and it's Time Eddie was a blast and fun and exhausting, but in a different way from Planet Comic Con, in a in a way that's almost more enjoyable because it's almost not as exhausting as Planet Comic Con just because of the crowds and the almost frantic nature of a bigger convention. While you're busy all the time, it's kind of a slower pace for Time Eddie, and I really like that about it. It's, it's a nice change of pace as far as conventions go, at least the ones that I'm used to going to. In a way, it's, and this is interesting, Glenn, I didn't really hit upon this until you said that, it's stepping back in time, because this is the way things were done. And despite the research and the pictures and the things that we've seen about, well, this is how they used to do them, I, there's a part of me that still refuses to believe that cons went on when Doctor Who was <laughs> not a thing, you know, it could, because it was so cult and so underground. And then I learned, oh, yeah, they would bring, John Nathan Turner was a big fan of bringing people over here. And I went, no way, get out. He never did that. <laughs> yeah, they were in Atlanta. No, no, they weren't. They didn't do that. Just because it, 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 it's such a weird disconnect. But seeing it in that light, that this is the, you know, it wasn't a Wizard World event. It was of this kind of event that suddenly makes it go oh you know what yeah that does that makes a lot more sense so it's it's really kind of cool to well that probably did happen <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no they never did that but just just to be able to kind of think about it and 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 walk those halls and and look at the guests and, and the interactions with people and and go yeah this is this is probably exactly what it was like when you got into a room full of people who suddenly all discovered they loved the same thing you know, and not just geek stuff in general. Star Trek and Doctor Who and 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 you know uh, Star, Wars. Star Wars and whatever it, you know Harry Potter, whatever else it happens to be, but specifically Doctor Who. That it, it's 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 just an amazing environment. It really is. I can't wait to try the rest of them. <laughs> 
I think the someday. one thing that I, I missed out on is I didn't get to as many panels as I'd have liked to this year. Uh, <laughs> you got to more than you thought you were well, going to. <laughs> one of the, well, well I, I didn't get a set on some of the ones that I had intended to set on because one of the things that ended up happening was uh, we we got there on Saturday morning, and we first thing we did was our quiz show, which I think went over wonderfully. It really uh, did. We would have liked to have had more people, but based on the fact that it was at 10 o'clock in the morning, I think there just wasn't a lot of people that had filed into the convention yet. And but many didn't have their thinking caps on yet. <laughs> um, Still waking up. Fortunately, we had a pretty decent crowd, especially by the end of it. We had a lot more people that had trickled in. Um, but we did get, I thought, three Excellent contestants. Oh, oh, they contestants were so, were so good. Which is, is a contrast to the last convention because the last convention that we did was Planet Comic Con when we debuted the show. And while I think the selection was a bigger selection of people that wanted to get on the panel, the unfortunately, as we talked about the generality of the con, is we ended up with one or two. We, well, we here the, on, the honest truth of it is is we ended up with a classic series, new series fan, a new series fan. And somebody that knew very little about Doctor Who. And so it was a very uneven uh, contestants. And so it was, a, it was a bit of a struggle, and especially for our first one. Coming to a Doctor Who convention, <laughs> we got three very knowledgeable new series and classic series contestants out of it. And I think that's why that contestant panel worked so well. Yeah. Um, also, it helped that we had it polished a bit more. Now, you know, having been able to debut it at uh, Planet Comic Con was wonderful and we're glad that they afforded us that and we would love to go back and do it again on the flip side of that this one was much smoother i think because we 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 were more comfortable in our shoes we we, we knew what we were doing this well time. you were we i was lost <laughs> we expect that and so <laughs> and the um, audience was very perceptive. the audience was very perceptive and uh as i said as as that audience grew they were they were really getting into it i think uh, but it went really well we had a grand time and uh if you haven't seen this and we happen to be invited back somewhere again to come see this please come see it yeah, it's one absolutely. of those things that unfortunately and i said it before we're not going to put video of this out number one because we want you to come experience we have video but we're not going to release it <laughs> uh, and you might see snippets of that video but we we want you to come experience that we want it to be something special for the people that are involved um so after that was done we we're just like okay, one down. Here's here's what we had. We had <laughs> originally we had a uh, we had our, our game show and the, or a quiz show, and then we were going to do a panel with Peter Davison in the afternoon. So we had a we had blocked out about a four hour break, or, or not break, but a four hour. action. Uh, let's just, 10, 11, 11, 12, 1, 2. Yeah, three. We had a three-hour gap where we could have done other things that we were going to talk about. We were going to go get some coffee. And... <laughs> we could take it easy. As we're we were... enjoy the con. So that was our day for that day. We all had two panels, or we had two events that we were going to do, and that was it. And we were going to do other things at the con. We had, there was some scheduling confusion because originally when we had been set up for this, we were going to do uh, a panel with Caitlin Blackwood on Saturday. And or they, that was what they wanted us to do, and then uh, what we had to switch it, I believe, to Sunday because Sean had a photo op that morning, and so unfortunately, after we're done, they had there was some confusion, and they thought we were still doing the Caitlin panel. <laughs> they so shifted us; they just didn't take us off. Too. Yeah, and in fact, the, the schedule reflected it correctly. But as we were headed out, they were asking us, "Are you guys ready to do this?" And we were a bit confused, and we were like. Uh, but we're doing tomorrow. Remember, you switched it. And Karen looked at his calendar and says, oh, my gosh, you're right. I did flip that. So he had acknowledged that he did it. And at that point, I said, you know what? Uh, so they said, well, we don't have anybody to do it. And I said, and he said, can you guys do it? And, of course, we said, well, Sean's got this photo available. And I thought, you know what? Keith and I will do it. And Keith is nowhere near, so he doesn't know that I've fallen. I'd wandered him. off. And so I'm Keith going, had gone for coffee. Keith, Keith come, come. And it was it was one of those things where we we knew Caitlin we know oh, Caitlin yeah. we we had done a panel with her at Planet Comic Con last year not this last one but last year as I was corrected in, <laughs> in the beginning of the panel um, but we had done a panel with her last year so we were already familiar with her and knew what kind of questions we were going to ask and so I said let's, and we, and let's we do had this. already prepared for a panel to, the next yes, day anyway we were ready so to we do kind of anyway. had questions in our mind so we came in there and we sat down and we did an hour panel with uh, Caitlin Blackwood which it's a wonderful just a charming little lady she's great and she's she's very with it now she's still 
I thought she got. Uh, she's she, she's she, over that shyness. She's opened up a yeah, lot she's more. She's opened up a lot more than she did. You got to get her on the right uh, subject. Yeah, and you do have to talk to. <laughs> but uh, Keith and I did that panel, and Sean, I guess he wanted in eventually, and never came up on the stage. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing. He, You're right. I didn't. Here, here, here's the deal. First of all, no, I, no, you. I'm not teasing. No, 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 you no, no, didn't. no. I'm teasing that I make it sound like I cared. I, 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 I have to say, first of all, a huge thank you to Karen for allowing me the opportunity. To, to step away from that because originally we had panels scheduled both Saturday and Sunday at 11 which happened to be the two Peter Davidson photo op times were at 11 on Saturday 11 on Sunday and that's kind of the one thing that you know other than our massive autograph collection the one thing that Mel and I really is like we've got to get a photo with the doctor that's that's the thing so and, and autogra- to be honest or to be Fair autographs are pretty easy because you can kind oh, yeah. of get them whenever, get them and there are several times that they're assigned. Right, the photo is a, is a set thing. So I, we we talked to Kieran ahead of time and said, "Dude, is there any chance at all we can get out of this?" I because if not, I understand. I it's your con, and I'm here to support it in any way that I can and help out. You need me to be on a panel, I'll be on a panel. But he worked it out and said, "No, we don't need you guys for that. We'll switch it to the other day." And we we're like, "Okay, cool." So that was the first thing. Thank you for allowing that to happen. The second thing is that okay, despite the fact that that had a snafu in it. You two guys stepped up and were like, yeah, we got this. Sean I, Glenn I, got his Simon Fisher Becker moment. I can't. <laughs> I, I genuinely. And we didn't record that panel either. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> At least not on purpose. Not a, no, well, yeah. I this think, time. This I, time we didn't I still purpose. feel so bad. I think Simon's mad at me. I really genuinely think he's miffed that that didn't happen. Anyway, I, I, I didn't get a chance to tell you guys. Thank you for picking up the ball and running with it in that regard and allowing me the opportunity to go over there and get my photo with Peter Davidson. Now, I did come into the room when we were there. There was a line and there was a process and there was a thing. Afterwards, I came into the room. And you guys were up on stage and I debated. Do I run up and join in now? And I thought, no, because I'm I'm a very small cog in this in this machine. You guys had it. Everything looked like it was going well. Caitlin was there responding to things. You guys were bouncing questions back and forth. If I had gone up, I feel like it would have drawn attention away from the three of you and brought it onto the late newcomer, and you didn't want that, and you didn't want to have to introduce me, and I didn't want to put Caitlin off her game we and make her uncomfortable. <laughs> I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a fan. I'm going to sit in the audience and watch. And I thought about asking a question, but kind of the same thing. I was like, no, that is just going to draw attention <laughs> to the fact that you know it's not here. So I just let you do it, and I thought it went wonderfully. Well, unfortunately, fair, that means I can be replaced fairly easily. To be fair, <laughs> to be fair, Sean, I never want to introduce you, but uh, <laughs> it sticks in That's your why throat, he doesn't it? Himself all the time. It's just... <laughs> no, I, I just ah, I gotta talk to this guy again. So anyway, I think we had a very wonderful panel. Yeah, it was a great uh, panel. There were a lot of great... What I really liked about that panel was there were a lot of young people asking her questions, yeah. which I appreciate because I think... I mean, she's she's a mature young lady. She's 16 now, I believe. And so she is an older person, but I think she still connects with the younger viewers, especially since she was young when she was in the role. And so it was nice to have the kids come up there and ask her a lot of different questions. And they were very poignant questions. It wasn't well, like, what's your favorite color? It was things like, if you had to choose between, I love yes. the question, what was it? <laughs> if you had to choose between a sonic screwdriver, a Harry Potter wand, or a lightsaber, what would you choose? Yeah. And I think it stumped her a little bit. It did. Because <laughs> I think we finally came down on the fact that she'd just take all three. <laughs> so that, that, That's what was great about that panel was the the younger kids that came up and asked those sort of questions that you and I don't think of and some of the other adults don't think to ask those questions either. A magic sonic saber. (gasps) (laughs) So she got to have some of those experiences too. That's almost a little bit of rite of passage at some conventions Mm -hmm. that you get those oddball questions that, well, I wasn't expecting that. All right. (laughs) Well, I think the younger kids are more comfortable talking to somebody that's a, a little closer to their level yeah. and talking to an adult on the stage, too. Yeah, absolutely. And so it encouraged them to come up, as you say. So we did that, and after we were done, then we had less than two hours to <laughs> <laughs> until Peter Davidson's panel. Uh, and which, I, we, which we got to walk the vendor room. We did. We took that opportunity to do sort of some of those things that, that we, you know, we wanted to do around the convention. Um, and we did. We walked the vendor room. We got to chat with uh, Robert Collins, who is a yes. resident writer. Friend of the in, show. In uh, Wichita. 
and uh, he 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 was having a great he had a great Friday he had a great Saturday I don't think it's I talked to him again today I don't think his Sunday was as good as he wanted it to be but I think he made out really good on this one and in fact he was he was in such a mood this weekend too like a good mood he was just you could tell he was very encouraged by um, and, and I think he was having a lot of fun and yeah, he, he was getting a chance too. to interact with a lot of people he was and so we got a chance to uh, stand and talk with him for a while we talked to Gypsy who was uh, was up or down there representing the uh, Top Con for next year who had this. Excellent Roger Delgado oh, master he was so good. cosplay. He was so good. In <laughs> fact, I walked in and my first thought was, "Oh, there!" And I even knew ahead of time that that's what he was cosplaying. Oh, did you? <laughs> and I walked in and I go, well, "This guy's a really good." Ma- Hi, Gypsy. <laughs> he heard me. He was, I said, this is a really good master. Oh wait, it's Gypsy. So yeah, we sat and chatted with him a little bit about next year's Top Con. We learned about Deep Roy. Um, we're going. We're we're very encouraged by next year's Top Con, which we'll sounds talk, like it's going to be a lot of. Fun. We'll talk more about when that draws closer. Um, but a lot of th- good things coming there, and then you know got to walk around. What did you guys a lot think of the, the vendor stuff. room? I loved it, and here's why. Last year, I didn't feel that the vendor room was as eclectic. It didn't seem to have as much variety. It seemed like every place I went was kind of the same stuff. This year, somehow they've gotten vendors in there. That had a, a vast array of different kind of things. Uh, I think it was also laid out much better this oh, year. Oh, the, the layout of the convention entirely, entirely was yeah. fantastic. But the vendor round spe- room specifically was laid out a lot better. Uh, it wasn't the big square circle like it was last year. It actually had now they had more room in there too. They did because they had a, a, an extra panel room open because they weren't using the three rooms that divide, you know, they, they like a lot of convention rooms, they can divide them off. Which, and apparently free. they were supposed to take uh, They were the supposed to one. have another room, but uh, unfortunately on Tuesday the hotel brought it, took it back. Uh, but regardless of that, it was still laid Which out really I kind of well. like the fact that, I know that the vendors weren't as pleased, but it was kind of nice to have the celebrities in the atrium, and if you had a room that was over the balcony, you could look out and see Peter Davis yeah, Peter sitting Davis at his and table. Peter Will sitting there, yeah, Stephen you, you Thorne can, sitting there. You a lot of the, same and then the lines of people to get their the, autographs yeah. and the, the photo ops. I, I, that all layout was it's, great. It's nice atrium. to just walk by and see these guys that we've watched on television for all these years and on DVDs As opposed to them being in a corner and a there you have to actually destination spot to get to, and I agree yeah. that it's kind of it's kind of bad for the vendors because the vendors like the, to be in the same area. But it's probably better you, for the celebrities because you have to walk through and the tables and see things. And I understand that that's commerce. But it, on the flip side of that, it's very good for the the uh, convention goer to have a little more access than than that to the to the uh, celebrities. Well, and it's um, it's a constant reminder too of why you're there. Oh, yeah. You know, well, theoretically, while you're there, you came to see these people. And here they are. You know, that it just kind of reinforces It, 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 it keeps that. giving that open atmosphere that the convention has. Mm-hmm. Or so many of the other ones are kind of closed off and you're an arm's length or further away from the celebrities. Whereas here, it's a reminder that you can go up and talk to these people. Yeah, yeah. And if and there were times where there weren't people online, and we would just go up and say hi, you know, <laughs> was just, even if we weren't there for an autograph, we'd go up and, yeah. and say hi and chat with them just a little bit. That's something Mel and I always try to do. Is when we, we at any con, we try and you know, if there's somebody that's not going to line, we'll go by and say, hey, you know what? Thank you so much for coming to the area, because we're known as a flyover state for a reason, and just the fact that you came here and you're giving us the opportunity to have access to you we just we want to let you know how much we appreciate it and they seem to really you know just like oh thanks i mean they're they're i've had several people that were just really touched and shocked by it and i've had other people kind of go oh, okay yeah you're weird <laughs> <laughs> most people go okay yeah, <laughs> m- 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 most people are like you're right it's a flyover state for a reason <laughs> but um you know we, we did the same with stephen thorne you know i told him hey you know i don't know if you remember we met you at gala a few years back but you know enjoyed you then enjoyed you now very much appreciate you coming and you He's such a great guy. He's so gracious. Um, then uh, we didn't eat yet. We went and did our we did. Peter Davison yeah. panel at 1 o'clock, which was wonderful. The man is a storyteller. The man oh. is so very much with it now and has some great stories. And it doesn't even take a lot of prompting. But the nice thing about Davison that I got was that he sat down there and he – when he came in, you, he he connected with the audience. Yes. But he still had sort of that, yeah, okay, you know, I've been through this routine presence when we were introducing <laughs> ourselves and things like that. But when we sat down and we Once launched into talking. our questions, he was so personal and just really connected with us. 
Um, the the questions we ask were never diverted. They were never you know because I I imagine as a cele- if I were a celebrity and he's not an old man but getting up there in years there are a lot of stories you've told over and over again. There's a lot of things that you may not necessarily remember. He remembers all of these different things about it and there's times that he kind of struggled with t- episode titles and things like that and I expect that because you're t- you've done it so many times. Um, but he was just really this genuine, he felt to me like this genuine guy that enjoyed being there, enjoyed talking to us, enjoyed talking to the audience. The one thing I felt very bad about is the fact that we had so <laughs> many questions for him that by the end and of the panel were, we only had chance for three questions from the audience. And there were questions we didn't get to. Yeah, there were definitely <laughs> questions we didn't get to. Was, I had a list. I had a list of questions well, that I wanted to get and to. And part of that is because he's such a great storyteller, one question would almost take up ten minutes because he would tell such a wonderful story that it was so engrossing that it would just go on. And Yeah, okay, just keep telling me stories, Peter Davison. Can you yeah. be my grandpa? Yeah, <laughs> And, and unlike a Kevin Smith story, it didn't stray. No, it stayed on topic. Wildly beyond topic. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it was just a ten-minute in-depth well, occasionally story. Occasionally, he would stray a little bit, but he was really good about circling back. Right. And that's what I like about yeah. somebody that's telling these stories and recounting these things is he he can very easily tangent and still be interesting, but circle right back around with what what the topic was. Yeah, absolutely. And he was very he was very good at that. So I, I just high praise for that. And uh, we do have a little special treat for you. Um, he actually had a panel over two days. We will talk a little bit about what happened. We're going to listen to that now. Well, everyone, welcome to Peter Davis. Thank you. Well, I think one of your biggest roles that people were familiar with before Doctor Who, obviously, was the character Tristan on All Creatures Big and Small. And... Is it is it true that those at the BBC they saw you in that and that was what had them in mind for you to replace Tom Baker as the Doctor in Doctor Who? It was more specific than that. Um, all, all creatures great and small uh, uh, was a job was a, a series that John Nathan Turner worked on for a short time as a production unit manager, and he left because he got an opportunity to become a producer of, of Doctor Who. So. Uh, um, he left after, I think, one season of All Creatures. And I hadn't really spoken to him for some years until he rang me up that night and said, you know, how do you feel about being uh, the next Doctor? So it was more specifically, it wasn't really the powers of B, it was more specifically John, I think. He just, he liked, he liked the character of Tristan, and we got on very well, and uh, he was fun, and um, he just thought, yeah, let's have him. <laughs> it's kind of offer you can't refuse, really. It's a bit like the Mafia. Um, uh, 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 but because um, I did, I was very unsure about it, uh, uh, and he took me out for lunch uh, at a place called Julie's Wine Bar, which is very close to the BBC. Um, and you know, it was him taking me out to a restaurant as opposed to the BBC canteen, uh, and so he, he, I realised he was serious. And I, and I, but I did have, I said this yesterday, but I'll say it again. I, you know, I did have serious, serious concerns about it, uh, which I was going to voice to him. Uh, over over lunch, but then he bought a bottle of wine and got me a bit uh, uh, drunk. And um, by the by the time we got to sticky toffee pudding dessert, I'd sort of given away really and agreed to do it. <laughs> so so much for my resolve. Um, <laughs> but I didn't regret it. I mean, it is it is. You, you know, listen, it, this was an iconic series that I had grown up watching. So I think I was always fighting a losing battle in terms of turning it down. Uh, I had my reservations, p- partly because, you know, I was quite young, uh, I was doing quite well, and there were other things I wanted to do, and I was concerned that Doctor Who might uh, put an end to those things, you know, uh, it, it's very much a, a, something that's going to stay with you. Um, but uh, it, what the heck, you know, in the end, how can you turn that part down? What was that transition like, going from being a supporting cast member on All Creatures Great and Small to the lead in Doctor Who? Was there a big transition? Was Did you struggle with that at all? Well, I don't really look upon All Creatures in the end as being a supporting part. I think it was what they we, you, you call an ensemble piece. I mean, we were... You kind of started... Yeah, we were... grew as a character more and more yeah. throughout the series. Yeah. Uh, and that was really because of uh, uh, Christopher Timothy's generosity as an actor. You know, he was the star, but he wanted it very much to be an ensemble piece. And, and Robert Hardy, who played my older brother Siegfried, 
liked the way the brothers worked, so he said, you know, I want more scenes with, with this upstart, Tristan. Um, and, and so I was brought into the series more. Um, it seemed like a, a, a logical step. When I finished All Creatures, I was then doing two comedy series, um, uh, both of which I was playing the lead in. So uh, it, it wasn't really that much of a step. It was a step upwards, mostly because I'd grown up watching the series, and you know, William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton were my doctors. So it was intimidating, there's no doubt about that. Um, but not because it was playing a, a leading character for the first time. Um, I didn't really think about that aspect of it, really. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was daunting in a way, I must admit. Did you bring the character of Tristan or any of the other characters you play to the character of the Doctor? Did you, did you think any of those added anything to the Doctor? <clears throat> well, there's no doubt, yes, of course, because uh, um, that's what any actor will do, despite the fact he, he will tell you differently. There's always parts of uh, 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 yourself uh, uh, that you put in every part, and therefore there's going to be something of a previous part in the part you're playing now. And it's an odd thing, you know, uh, Audiences, generally speaking, quite like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have the idea, I always thought I was a kind of character actor, really, uh, 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 and that I would, you know, I like to create a different character, and to a certain extent that's true. John Nathan Turner, uh, you know, when I was, we were talking about how I should do the part, he said to me, well, you know, the reason I wanted you, you to play the part is because you're a, a, a personality actor. Now, I'd never thought of myself as being that at all. In other words, just someone who, uh, just plays himself, basically, because uh, uh, I sort of created, well, I wasn't like Tristan at all. I was very shy uh, 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 growing up, and I sort of managed to overcome the shyness partly through finding the character of Tristan. Um, so yeah, certainly, I think there's absolutely a, um, a part of me that went into Tristan, and therefore part of the Doctor, which is me, which is Tristan, if you see what I mean, it's all connected. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, a story I, I tell in the book that I've just written. <laughs> what, is that? what is that wonderful plug there? Um, which apparently I think you can only get in Kindle over here. I thought you could get it. I did have some copies, but I've sold out now. If you weren't smart enough to buy one first thing this morning, um, <laughs> Sadly, I've run out. Um, anyway, but anyway, I wrote this book, right? And in, and in it, I, I, tell, I tell this story that um, when I was announced as, as, as Doctor Who, there was great interest because I'd been Tristan, and there was a, a, a sort of lunchtime magazine program called Pebble Mill at One. And they decided to uh, invite me on, on the show and also a, a, a sort of select group of ordinary viewers who might suggest ways in which I should play the doctor. They obviously thought I needed help. Uh, um, so uh, I, was, I was facing these, I think about eight of them. Uh, they came up with different ideas, and, uh, but the, the one that, that struck me uh, as sort of inevitable was the guy who said, uh, um, I think you should be like Tristan, but brave. <laughs> And really, that was the blueprint for my doctor, I think. Um, I, I sort of pretty much stuck to that. Tristan, but brave. Um, kind of. <laughs> it was a good starting point, anyway. I'm sure you've been asked this hundreds of times, but how much of a struggle was it to follow up Tom Baker's doctor? He had been in the role for seven years and had become probably so ingrained in that uh, series, how difficult was it to make the transition, and did you, did you struggle, or was it very natural? I, well, uh, foolishly, maybe, I didn't have a problem in my head with Tom at all, because I, I, I hadn't really watched that much of him as the Doctor. I was aware that he was very popular as the Doctor, and he'd done it for seven years, but my point of reference was William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton. They were my Doctors, Patrick Troughton particularly. Um, and yeah, it's very important. So I, I, I was, I was more uh, thinking about living up to them than living up to Tom Baker. I wasn't really aware of the problem with Tom until I came here. In fact, um, my my very first uh, uh, um, convention, which I took there yesterday, was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
at the Hotel Camelot, which, uh, which I now sad to hear has been demolished. Thank the Lord for that. Um, uh, uh, it was a terrible place. It was the most bizarre. You couldn't find a place less like a castle uh, in the time. And but it, except that it did have a moat around it, a concrete, a concrete moat. And I had a room I remember on two levels. And you, you, you sort of walk up a spiral staircase to the next level, and there was damp dripping round down the walls, <laughs> even then. Um, but I remember I, I thinking then, well, that's when I first realised that. For most people, not for everybody, for most people it, over here in, a, in America, they only had known Tom Baker. There were certain uh, uh, PBS stations who had shown John Pertwee, uh, but for the most part, uh, to everyone, it, they didn't even understand what a regeneration was. So suddenly, uh, uh, you know, they'd be watching um, uh, Legopolis, and then you know, Tom would fall off a gantry. And he would turn into, it's that bloke from the Vet series. <laughs> <laughs> the heck is he doing here? What is this about? Why? <laughs> and um, suddenly they were faced with me, who they literally only knew as Tristan. <laughs> so they must have thought, what on earth is going on? But, so I think probably from the audience over here had more of a problem adjusting to another actor, let alone me. Um, playing the part of the Doctor than in Britain. In Britain, it was established that you know, the Doctor regenerated, and admittedly, I was younger um, than, than the previous Doctors, and therefore, it was probably a bit more, uh, um, uh, a bit more difficult for the audience than it would be normally, but I just focused on things that I could do better than Tom, like run faster. <laughs> Uh, and so you wouldn't see me running quite fast in Doctor Who and hoping that counts as a character. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the show obviously takes a more serious turn for your Doctor, I think. I think the, the comedy and the humor is still there, but they sort of step away from the silliness and, and obviously the, the, the horror aspect that the Hinchcliffe era had taken uh, mm. with it. Um, do you think that was a... a, a I don't want to say, uh, do you think that that move was appropriate and do you think it worked for the series? I think it was overdone. I think that uh, um, the truth is that uh, you know, Tom had worked with Douglas Adams, of course, as a script editor. And so there was this, what we would call in Britain, undergraduate humor, which became a very important part of it. And, and I kind of, I must admit, when I watched it, I kind of liked it. I thought there were moments when it was, it went too far. I remember there was one point when I remember thinking, I think Tom was about to be sliced in half by something and he was offering jelly babies around. And I thought that's really, you know, you've got to, there's a time for the humor and a time for the important bits and maybe it got a bit out of hand. But I think John's overreaction to it when I took over was based on the fact he just didn't get that humor, which is very much sort of Python-esque. Uh, 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 and uh, as was demonstrated in, in Hitchhiker's Guide as well, uh, he just didn't get it. I got it. I might, well, I got it completely, uh, really. But I had a, an uphill battle because he just didn't want any jokes in it at all. Um, so <clears throat> we would try and squeeze them in occasionally, uh, 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 and you know we had some victories and some defeats on that. But yeah, I think it was just he. He just didn't find that funny. He just didn't, didn't get those sort of those, those that undergraduate, undergraduate humour, um, which was a shame, I think. But uh, at the same time, uh, I enjoyed the sort of the fights we had on various jokes. I'd like to have got a few more in, but um, it, you know that was just the nature of things. He was the producer, and I was only the actor. <laughs> <laughs> well, and with your era, for the first time almost since Trouton. You had more of a crowded TARDIS. You had more companions. Yeah. What was it like balancing having all these actors on the show with you? Well, I, I kind of liked the little. It was a little sort of family. I thought there were a bit. I think it was one too many. I think. I, could, I think that we just didn't quite know what to do with all three of them at, a, at one particular time, which is why I think we decided pretty soon after that one of them had to go, um, and it was simply we. I, I had various 
not disagreements. We never really disagreed. We, I never disagreed with John really, except we had we had discussions, healthy discussions, I would say, <laughs> uh, um, about which companion should bite the dust. Um, uh, and uh, I have to say, in the end, I think I probably won. Um, but because I think he wanted to get rid of Nissa first of all. And I was very much against that because I felt that she was the one companion that was there that was on the doctor's side. Um, so I very much wanted to keep her on board. And indeed, I wanted them to de develop her character, which I thought was underdeveloped and not really written very well. But that was a common thing with all companions at that time. They didn't really know how to write for them. They didn't, uh, and I, I'm not saying that coming from a position that I knew better. I just don't think they wrote very good companion parts at that point. Um, uh, and indeed, talking to Janet, she'll tell you that in uh, 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 more straightforward and blunt terms. Um, uh, um, so, yeah, there were, I, I, but I did like, I liked the idea, you know, that, that I was coming into this established family, I kind of liked that, and I think they kind of looked quite like me, really. I don't, I think they'd had uh, a pretty tough time with Tom towards the end, because he, he was, he was leaving, he was, he was disgruntled about things, and I think he was, he, he'd been a bit uh, unpleasant to, to the, um, the, the, the camp, camp, you know, the, the family of companions that I inherited, so they were quite pleased to see the skinny blonde bloke looking quite <laughs> happy and friendly. Um, <laughs> well, and your doctor was a bit more fatherly. Yeah, he was. That really, yes. and that's something that we haven't seen since uh, yeah, William Hartman. Yeah, and I think that. Well, I think that came out of the fact that I wanted to also make him more uh, uh, approachable. I wanted to. I, I see. What I liked about William, uh, Patrick Troutman's time is that he had a vulnerability. I felt that had vanished. It had vanished through John Pertwee and through Tom's time, I think. Uh, uh, that's not meaning saying that they, they weren't good, but they, they, uh, that vulnerability has sort of vanished. John was very much absolutely in control, had all the answers. Uh, uh, Tom was very much the same way in a, in a different, uh, from a slightly different approach. Uh, and so I wanted to make the Doctor slightly more vulnerable, and I think that actually helped the relationship aspect of it, although it was again un underwritten, I don't think it was written particularly that well, but uh, that was a, just a common factor at that time. You talked a little bit about the death of Adric, obviously. Um, I know in fandom there are grave judgments as to, I shouldn't say judgments, I think uh, more elation that <laughs> the character was done away with, but I'm curious about what was the reception from the public or the viewers in the UK at the time because this was really the first time I believe since Katarina and you could even argue uh, uh, thank you Sarah Kingdom that they had actually killed a companion on the show what was the reception of, of, of taking that approach in uh, at Earthshock well, probably overall, looking back on it in res retrospect, with hindsight, not good. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I always thought, I must admit, at the time, I thought it was a pretty good way to leave the series. I mean, you're, you're leaving in a heroic and spectacular way, in a way that no one will forget. Um, and I didn't think it was particularly um, a, a bad way to go. And I thought it also... Uh, um, reinforce the idea that bad things can happen, you know, that, 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 and that would, uh, in a way, help the show. I'm not sure if I was right about that. Uh, of course, Matthew was very much against being blown up. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, um, I think it was mainly because he thought, well, I can't come back. But in fact, I think he was back as a strange ghost-like figure about two stories later. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I told this story yesterday, but it's, it's quite funny, so if anyone wasn't here yesterday, I'll tell the story again and again. And this has partly contributed to the fact that I've had a slight rethink about, you know, whether it was good. Um, uh, uh, years later, when the series came back, um, uh, under Russell T. Davis's stewardship, um, there was a storyline uh, uh, that involved Rose, where the rumor was uh, the following week that Rose was going to die. Now, at the time, I... Two, young boys, you know, they were, I don't know how old they were, maybe five and seven or something like that. And they were devoted to Rose. They loved Rose desperately. And uh, I, so I thought it was important that I, I sent an email to Russell T. Davis, who of course had watched the classic series. He's a big fanboy, Russell. 
I, I, I sent an email to Russell saying, you know, is it true that Rose dies next week? Because I think I should be careful about whether my, um, my sons watch the show. Uh, and he sent an email back to me which simply said, um, you killed Adric, what do you care? <laughs> um, so, I think it clearly had a, a greater effect on the fans than I thought of, uh, anticipated at the time. <laughs> Although I think, in a way, it may have driven Russell T. Davis to bring the series back. Um, although he never resurrected Adric, did he? Um, anyway, um, yeah. So I don't know. It, it seemed like all I can say is it seemed like a good idea at the time, and it was a fairly good way. Uh, uh, it was only marred by the fact that. Because it, it was such an emotional scene, it, that very last scene after he's been blown up, Janet, Sarah and I, this sounds appalling, but we, it wasn't really as bad as it sounds, but we just had a terrible time not laughing in that last series, that last scene where we just look at each other. You'll notice if you watch it that we don't actually look at each other because it, and when we did, we just... <laughs> <laughs> not because of Adric, it was just that thing, you know, when you, you know, suddenly have to be really desperately sad and... You just want to laugh. <laughs> uh, you, speaking of the new series, you came back uh, for the charity special, Time Crash. Yeah. And uh, now you had been doing, you would revisited the Doctor many times because you were doing uh, Big Finish audios. Uh, yes. And, and, and slipping back into that role. Um, but what was it like to be able to come back to television, even though it's, it's such a short amount of time, and getting to work, obviously, with David Tennant? Yes, it was fantastic. I mean, it wasn't like going back into my TARDIS, because by that time the series was made in Cardiff, and the TARDIS console room was what they call a standing set. In other words, it's, they build it at the beginning of the season, and it sits there undisturbed for the six months it, it takes to make the series. In my day, they simply wheeled the console in from the, the scene uh, uh, a dock, and stuck, stuck it up there, uh, uh, and it, it was always slightly overlit, and you know, it wobbled a bit, everything wobbled a bit, but that was part of its charm. Um, uh, and so it was great to work on a, on a, a, a console room that was so believable, and, uh, and of course, and it was brilliant working with David. Uh, um, this is before he became related to me, of course. Uh, um, <laughs> Actually, I, I like to say that that's the only reason I did it. You marry my daughter, or, or, or else I won't do it. Um, uh, that's a lie. Um, uh, no, it was uh, it was great because uh, Stephen. What happened was Stephen Moffat, just uh, who I met uh, through a mutual friend, uh, and uh, um, I'd also worked with his wife had produced a comedy series that I'd been in. Um, and they were around our house one Sunday, and he just said, how would you feel about doing this um, thing for children in need? I've got this script. And I said, yeah, no, I'd love to do it. And I got the script, and it was a brilliant script, because it worked on, on many levels. It worked as, you know, David Tennant watching me in Doctor Who, and it also worked as the tenth Doctor remembering being the fifth Doctor. So it was a brilliant little script. And he said, I think it runs about uh, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, um, so I learnt it. Well, I was in the middle of doing a, um, a show called Spamalot in the West End. Um, yay! Uh, playing King Arthur. And so, and I'd grown a beard. So literally on, on the Saturday night uh, after the show, uh, with the car waiting, revving up outside the stage door, I had to shave off my beard, jump in the car, be driven three hours to, to Cardiff, got up in the morning to film this thing, Time Crash. Anyway, we, we both, <laughs> anything that was wrong with it was we both spoke so fast, I think it only lasted about 12 minutes. We cut, <laughs> we cut three minutes or so off the timing of it. But it was great to do. And I was a bit nervous because it was David's uh, console room. He was a bit unforgiving, actually, I have to say, about the levers I pressed. Because, of course, he, in his time with the Doctor, had designated certain levers as being doing certain things, but he hadn't, he hadn't got around to telling me that. So I kept pushing the wrong lever and he kept going, who's just moved this lever? And I thought, well, there's only me on the set, it must be me. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please marry my daughter. Um, so, uh, uh, and um, so, 
Apart from that one hiccup, we had a great time. And by the time we finished in the afternoon, we finished early in the afternoon, I thought I could go on for another three or four years doing this. Um, but sadly, that was all there was to it. So, but it was great to do. And you've been such an ambassador for the series because you have, as we mentioned, come back for the charity special, but you also, as I was alluding to, uh, joined the Big French range as it was getting the main range series of Doctor Who off. Um, what, 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 what brought you to that initially, and what's it been like working on the audios for all these years? Well, the first thing we did was, I think it was called The Sirens... Of time. time. Science of time, thank you very much. Uh, and it was a story um, uh, with Sylvester and Colin and myself. I have no idea what that story was about. <laughs> I never understood it. I kept saying, what does this mean? What are we doing? No one could explain it to me at all. Now the thing is that Colin and Sylvester didn't seem to mind about that at all. <laughs> well, I, was, I was bravely trying to figure out what the hell that story was about. And they went, oh, just say the lines. <laughs> um, and that was really the last time until recently that I'd, I'd worked with either of them in a story. I did, I did a story with Sylvester not that long ago, but apart from that, that we then went off into our own directions. And I love, I love doing them, you know, I, I just thought it was great. I made um, no attempt to explain that, you know, what, that I was older. I never tried to play it. And I just sort of thought, well, I'm going to play my doctor, and, it, and people seem to think that's okay. So. But I love doing them, they're great to do. Is it, was it easy to fall back into that role or did you have to kind of rediscover it? I didn't really think about it. We just, you just do it. I don't I can't explain it any more than that. I think there's just something about that part that was so familiar, oddly, that, that um, whether it was any good or not, I don't know, but I just sort of stepped back into it. I can't you know, guarantee the quality, just. <laughs> well, what just, was it like reuniting with their companions? It was great, actually. It was great. I was very pleased to do that. Um, uh, initially, I think it was um, Janet and Sarah and Matthew. I'm not sure. Am I wrong about this? Matthew came along a bit later on because he was in America. It was nice to work with Janet again because I think Janet has evolved a lot over the years. She, you know, when she, when she, did, and she'll admit this herself. I think when 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 we did the original series. She, w she had a very strange boyfriend who didn't like her Australian accent and didn't like her name. So when we were meeting in the bar afterwards, he would call her Claire. Uh, and I said, why is he calling you Claire? He, he doesn't like Janet. And she also said to me uh, at one point, she said, of course, you know, of course, she was speaking this very rather posh English accent. And she didn't know, with no trace of Australian at all because he didn't like the Australian accent. And she said to me at one point, oh, I don't really remember how to do an Australian accent. <laughs> because now you ring her up, she goes, Hi oh, Pete, how are you? <laughs> so now I feel I've got that, and we're really very good friends now. We bring each other up quite often and just chat and talk. And it's very nice to rediscover that and to get it. And what you get now is the real Janet that was somehow disguised a bit at that time. And she was very nice, we got on very well. It was just she had this rather odd side to her personal life that I, I always thought was a bit, um, a bit controlling. And indeed, uh, um, once again, if you asked her about that, she'd be slightly more blunt about how controlling it was. Um, there you go. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, genesis of the idea of the Five-ish Doctors and how that came The Five-ish Doctors, yes. Well. <laughs> how long have we got? Um, Good doctor. Hey, yes, that's true. <laughs> I'll just go back to go back to one o'clock and we'll start again. Um, the five-ish doctors. Well, it goes back a long way. Uh, um, I I had I was doing con the old convention over in uh, um, the United States, and I was booked to do a convention called Gallifrey. This is going back to 2010, I think, actually, um, uh, in in California, and um, I then got offered a job. The West End of London, a musical. So I had to ring up uh, uh, Sean, the organizer, and say, I'm very sorry, I can't make it. And he said, well, could you just do a very quick video saying, I'm sorry, I can't make it. And I was doing this uh, um, musical, and I thought, well, I'm bit, did I just make it a bit more interesting? So I did this little five minute short about apologizing for not being at the convention. 
Uh, and I, I then sort of set up a thing where I was filming it in uh, uh, um, the actual leading lady's dressing room, unbeknownst to her. And she comes and she comes in and throws me out. And various little things happen, like I, I, I talk to the camera and I talk about how I'm going to go out and meet all my fans because they're all desperate for autographs. And then I'm just going to leave it so they're really desperate for my autograph. Then I go up there and they've all gone home, of course. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care. Um, um, and then I, I come home and the last scene is sitting in my house drinking a glass of wine, saying, well, here I am in my, you know, palatial home. Uh, 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 I'm just saying, once again, I'll, I hope to see you next year. And then David Tennant comes in and tells me to get out of his house. <laughs> um, so, and that went down quite well at Gallifrey. And so the next year, when I actually did turn up, I did another one about turning up. Uh, 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 and you can see, actually, the, uh, these are online. If you want to put in uh, uh, Gallifrey 2011 or something, I don't know. You'll find them. They're quite funny. The next one was about me missing the plane. Uh, and then um, I happened to go past the Doctor Who exhibition in London and walk in and find my own console room and get in and start working it and I turned up in Gallifrey. So, <laughs> so it was, uh, um, uh, uh, that was quite good. And so anyway, what happened after that was I, I enjoyed making these things. I was just filming them myself with my video camera, sitting on a tripod, literally pressing the, play, the record button and running around the front. Um, uh, so I was at a convention in about 2000, I'm sorry, some of you probably know this, but I was at a convention, I think in about 2012, it may have been Roanoke, I'm not sure, but um, I, I was asked a question, you know, that I'd been asked several times, do you think the classic doctors are going to be in the 50th anniversary special? And I said, um, rather foolishly, I said, I didn't think uh, that we would be, but if we weren't, I was damn well going to make my own. And of course, there were several people there with video cameras. Uh, video only. And so when I went to the next convention, which I think was in Florida, uh, um, someone got up and said, oh, apparently you're making your own 50th anniversary special. And I'd forgotten that I'd said it. <laughs> so I thought, oh dear, I'd better make one. Um, so I had a kind of idea that, that involved, uh, um, first of all, me um, sneaking in, in, into the 50th anniversary special filming and, and trying to get in the back of shot. And then I thought, well, why don't I ask Colin and Sylvester and Paul if they'd like to be involved in it? Because we were doing a joint convention thing in Australia uh, the following April, I think it was. And they said yes. Well, I don't think they had any idea what it was <laughs> at all at the time. So they said they kindly said yes. And I'd also asked Stephen if, if I, he would mind taking part. I said, it's just me, honestly, just me filming with my own video. And I'm just going to put it, you know, just on line. I thought it might be fine. He said, yes, okay. So I, I, I then started writing the script and it kind of got longer and longer. <laughs> And I, uh, uh, we were meant to film something with Colin and Sylvester and Paul in Australia, but we never got around to it because we were too busy. Uh, and anyway, I sent a, um, the script to uh, Doctor Who offices in Cardiff um, and asked them, you know, to, to Stephen to see if he'd be prepared to just do this little bit. Anyway, someone else got hold of it down in uh, 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 Cardiff and they thought it would be a good idea to do as a charity thing with children in need. So they, uh, they called me down there. I thought they were going to say, you know, go away, we're not interested. And they said they gave me £20,000. <laughs> Here's £20,000, they said, for production. I know, to me, foolishly, and how I could have thought this, I thought that was quite a lot of money. <laughs> so they said at lunchtime, uh, uh, let's we'll have, sit down, we'll have a production meeting just to see how we can work this. Uh, uh, actually, I think it was £25,000. I think I'm on, uh, denying myself. It was £25,000. Uh, so we sat down for our first production meeting, and literally, by the end of lunch, the £25,000 had disappeared. Not on lunch. <laughs> Not on, like, just on things like, well, we'll need to hire this, we'll need to hire this. And I thought, what? This cost money? Uh, uh, anyway, so that was gone. And uh, But we started filming that, that day. We filmed a lot of little bits. We did bit, bits, I think, with... Uh, with, with Matt and David. Maybe that was the following week, actually. Uh, um, David and, and Matt Smith very kindly said they'd be in it. 
Matt, 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 I had to persuade David, I just lent on a bit. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, so he got, he got bigger and bigger. And then I thought, well, I, I can't really organize. Am I going on too much? No, no, we're going Tell me. Go. Okay, so I can't really organize it myself. So I, I, I thought, I need a producer. So my daughter, uh, at the time, was rather fancy herself as a producer. She said to me, oh, I'm tired of being an actor. I want, to be, I want to produce things. So I said, how about producing the five-ish doctors? <laughs> so she said, yeah, okay. And she, she then took it on, I mean, on herself. I mean, she was extraordinary because I think about two days later, she rang up and she said, um, oh, I've just read in the newspaper that John Barrowman is really cross because he's not in the 50th anniversary special. Uh, and there was this pause. I said, right, well, let's have it in hours then. <laughs> uh, so I... I so I wrote a scene for John Barrowman, <clears throat> and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and then I thought, <clears throat> and there was this actress who had just been working with David, and, called Olivia Coleman, who for years had been a, a sort of like a minor supporting actress in many things, and she's absolutely brilliant, but she, they just could have discovered her, and she was in everything at the time. So I said, well, I'll just write a scene here in which we haven't asked Olivia Coleman to be in it, and she's really dis depressed, because she said, normally I'm in everything. Uh, so that, we did that, and then I asked, I thought, you know, obviously, uh, John Pertwee's not around, Patrick's not around, so I'll get their children to be in it. Um, <clears throat> so we've got Sean Pertwee in the opening scene, and, and, and David Trout in, in a later scene, uh, and everyone just gave their time for nothing. And then the, the biggest coup, I suppose, was um, uh, Sylvester McCoy, uh, uh, who was very keen on, on being in it, said, you know, I... I the only problem is I, I have to go back to, um, to New Zealand to film The Hobbit. Um, I'm in it, you know. Um, actually, he didn't say that. I, that we, I created this monster of uh, Sylvester McCoy, going around saying he's in The Hobbit all the time. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, um, so I said, well, uh, you're going to go back to New Zealand. How about, maybe I could write a scene for Peter Jackson. In it. And he said, well, well, I'll ask him. So anyway, he, uh, he was meant to ask him. I don't know if he did or not. But anyway, I eventually got Peter Jackson's email address off Stephen Moffat. And I sent uh, uh, him a, um, an email saying, I'm doing this little video uh, in which uh, you know, I want to do a scene uh, uh, um, where he, he runs away from the Hobbit set. You know, would you be prepared to, to do it? And he wrote back an email literally five minutes later saying, yes, and I'll get Ian McKellen in it too. <laughs> And this is the point where I thought, this thing is going to have the best cast list of anything that's ever been done. It's extraordinary. And um, so, so he filmed it. Yeah, he filmed it. Sadly, I didn't go over there to direct him. He had to direct himself, which he probably had a bit of a problem with. I'd give him a couple of tips. Um, anyway, but he sent me the uh, uh, product. It was, it was fantastic. And uh, um, uh, we put it all together. By this time, I should mention, that um, Colin and Sylvester, who had been, it had been quite difficult to get their availability right because they, you know, it was a busy year. This was the 50th anniversary year. And there was a tipping point when I suddenly think they realized that this was quite a good thing to be involved in because uh, uh, um, both Colin and Sylvester, when they, before I bring them up and say, Are you available on this date? and they go, Oh no, sorry, I've got to go off to Milton Keynes to do something. Uh, they then ring up and say, I'll push back Milton Keynes and I'll be there on the filming day. So I, it suddenly became more important than anything else and I think that was the point where everything came together because they did, they gave out a lot of their time for no money, no one got paid any money for this. Um, and everyone we asked, with one exception, um, they said yes, we'll do it. And, uh, uh, and it was fantastic of them. The one exception sadly was, was Tom, who, who didn't really want, he, I met him earlier on in the year at a stamp, you know, we had post, we were on postage stamps, it was very exciting in Britain. Uh, I, I always thought you had to be dead to be on a, a stamp, but <clears throat> they made an exception for the doctors. Um, anyway, so Tom said, yes, I'd, I'd love to be in it. So I wrote him this, I thought, rather a good little scene. Um, but then I never heard from him again. I sent it to him, um, but I never heard from him. So I was talking this over with a, a, a friend, um, and I said, well, if he doesn't do it, the only thing I can think we can do is to use exactly the same clip as we used in The Five Doctors. Uh, <laughs> in The Five-ish Doctors. And there was this pause, and he said, 
I think that's a better joke. <laughs> so, I then, I thought, so we got the clip, we got the clip cleared, and then I lived in fear of Tom ringing up and going, yes, I'd love to do it. Because <laughs> then I'd have to say, sorry, you've been recast. <laughs> By your former self. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, um, it's a shame, I still think it's a shame we didn't do it, because it was quite a nice little scene, but uh, uh, he had his own reasons, that's fair enough. Uh, um, but, uh, and it was just magic, and we had a, we had a few fights uh, along the way, but I was, <clears throat> my main thing was, it was very much for the fans of the classic series who were going to be disappointed um, that they weren't, we weren't in it. It wasn't meant to be, <clears throat> but... but um, I wasn't making it for all fans of Doctor Who. I was very glad that they, they, everyone liked it. I mean, the fans of the modern series as well. But it was really primarily for the fans of the classic series, which is why there were all those sort of in jokes which you wouldn't get, you know, bits, bits of lines from uh, both Sylvester's Doctor and Colin's Doctor and things like that, um, which we threw in. Um, uh, the one thing I think the most difficult joke to get past uh, um, the producers, you know, because it was still it was sort of, uh, um, the people who produced Doctor Who, uh, Brian Lynch, was, was they were most worried about the fact that we were making a joke that John Barrowman might have a hidden family. <laughs> and so, I said, oh, I, I just don't know if you know if if uh, uh, John Barrowman would, likes the idea that people will know he's gay. <laughs> I said, I said, are you serious? John Barrowman? He walks around kissing boys every week. I mean, <laughs> the idea that John Barrowman would be offended by the implications he might be gay, and that the joke was that he had a hidden family, I think was the most extraordinary. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, we had a great time doing it, and it was a joy to do. And we, we, um, uh, I said at one point, which is probably a mistake, I said, you know, if, if they make us cut too much of it, I'll put out a sort of director's cut. But in fact, we cut hardly anything of it at all in the end, because uh, everything sort of fell into place and, and worked very well. And by that time, I just thought, I, I think I'd be a terrible director, because I didn't want to cut anything. I'd, be, I'd always be falling out with producers, because probably very badly, and I'd say, no, I like that joke, I'm going to keep it in. Um, so we didn't really cut much, uh, uh, and um, the night it went out, uh, it went out at 10.30 at the night in, in Britain, um, after a really terrible show on the BBC, not, not the anniversary special, the, 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 there was a show where the, they had companions on, and they had links with Los Angeles, and it was just a shambles really, I don't know if anyone ever saw it. Um, but then we went out, and of course, I think the relief of the fans after this terrible <laughs> conversation, a, a, a sort of peace a chat show thing that they had, the relief of the fans that there was something else to save the day <laughs> was, such, was so much that the comments were just extraordinary. Colin and Sylvester and I were sitting in the hotel at the 50th anniversary special, while all these comments were coming in, like, this is fantastic, and we were just going, yeah! Yes. <laughs> it was great. No, I'm very glad uh, that it, you know, it seems to go down very well indeed. Well, I just wanted to say that I remember on that day all the excitement surrounding the 50th, and we'd had a, a, a month worth of lead up to it. And I remember sitting there watching the 50th and just being in this wonderful <laughs> place that, you know, this is, this is my show and they've really done it up. And I thought, there's nothing that could top this. And then I saw the five at Dr. Doctor, Doctors, and I said, that's the capstone right there. That, was the, that just popped everything off. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. We even had a bit of a line from Matt Smith that wasn't in the 50th anniversary special. When he, you know, when we're underneath the sheets and he comes in, because uh, we, we, we cut it before the final cut, I think, of the anniversary special. And you get half a line extra of Matt Smith in the Five yeah, Doctors right. reboot. Right. So now we, we've asked Sylvester at another con, mm. will he confirm whether or not that you guys are actually under the sheets. <laughs> and he very coyly admitted, yeah, it's totally us. We've asked Colin Baker, and he yeah. would not comment. Right. And he kind of left it up in the air. We have you yeah. as a room full of witnesses. Well, I want an answer to I that question. I have a party line. If we were under those sheets. That's my party line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. Uh, um, yeah. 
I mean, you had to have voted with you, yeah. But it is true, you know, that going back to this thing about the, the Hobbit. I, the, this monster that I created by putting in the talking about the Hobbit all the time. Now he goes everywhere to it. I mean, the Hobbit, you know. He's, <laughs> <laughs> He did, he, even on the panel yeah. we were in, he did the same. He did the same. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time, but... Oh. It's, that, it's that Annika Will, she talks too much. She does, she does. I thought that story with John Lennon was going somewhere else completely. <laughs> we have, I believe, about five minutes. So if we can just have three questions that can be quickly answered, um, go ahead and come up here to the mic. Now... Peter will be here all weekend, so you guys feel free to come by and talk to him and ask him questions. There is another panel, I believe, tomorrow. There He'll is, be able to answer is, questions yes. for you then, but go ahead. I just love the story that the, uh, the doctor's daughter married the doctor. <laughs> and I wonder if there are any, like, Easter Sundays where three doctors were all sitting around arguing about who was the best. Um, I don't think we've ever argued about who was the best. I always defer to David. Uh, um, he always defers to me, so I think that's unspoken. We probably both really honestly think we were the best, but uh, we went, oh no, you were amazing. Oh no, you were amazing, I used to watch you. Um, no, we don't really talk about it. I mean, they come around, of course. I mean, they were literally uh, a week ago, they were around our house on, on a Sunday. So, um, but we just, uh, I usually you know, have a nice time, have lunch, walk the dogs. It's quite, that's quite funny, actually, because we both... You know, I mean, him with some cause, when he, when he goes out in public, he's usually wearing a baseball cap and dark glasses. And I, and I go out wearing a baseball cap and dark glasses. So you have this image of two people walking along, walking dogs, both wearing baseball caps and dark glasses on a day that's probably not very sunny. <laughs> and actually, in an, an attempt to disguise ourselves, we are the most conspicuous people <laughs> imaginable. You can imagine, what are those pillocks here there, wearing baseball caps and that? Oh, blimey, it's two doctors. Uh, uh, so probably, mistakenly, we do that. Although we would like to imagine we're, we're being incognito. Yes, no, we don't really discuss that. It's, now, it's weird because it's perfectly normal. But the first couple of times, I think it was probably a bit odd to have you know, David Tennant and myself uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sitting you know, in the same house um, on a Sunday afternoon. Although there was one stranger thing when we, uh, I think Matt Smith, David Tennant, Stephen Moffat, and myself were around Stephen's house. And I thought, if anyone knocked on the door now, <laughs> what would they think? <laughs> um, no, it's, 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 it, it's, it's now perfectly normal. It's a bit sad. It's a bit like, uh, you know, people sometimes ask, what do my kids think about the fact that you know, their, their father, and their brother-in-law uh, were both doctors. And they're so profoundly unimpressed. <laughs> uh, because they don't know anything different. Their, their friends go, wow, what? Your dad was a doctor and, and your brother-in-law's doctor? They go, yeah. I mean, there was one <clears throat> magic moment, which funny enough, I, I based a scene in, 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 the, in the Five Ish Doctors on where it wasn't quite the same, but I kind of based it on that, was that, that I was sitting watching the telly one day, and I was flicking through the channels, and uh, I, I appeared on, on some series that I'd done many years ago, and this one the kids were sort of, it was about sort of five or six years ago, so I called them into the room, and I said, hey, come in, come in, and I said, look, who's out on the telly? And they looked and went, you, and then just walked out. <laughs> So, you know, I don't, I don't think either of us, any of us, get much respect, really, from our, our children. No so it's just like a norm. If you can imagine such a thing, it's just, oh, yeah, it's David Tennant over there. Sitting on my sofa. Did, so what? Did David do the uh, traditional ask for your blessing for when, when he asked uh, Do you know, I'm not sure he did actually ask my daughter's hand in marriage. No. I'm not sure he did. I might have to bring him up about that now. So, yeah. You're quite right. I, no, I don't think he did. I think I was just informed. <laughs> <laughs> That's but sort you of know, the modern thing to do now. <laughs> it is the modern thing to do, but it was, I think, after they had two children. So probably it was a bit late to really officially go to, uh, you know. Uh, this, so. The scene you wrote for Tom Baker that didn't get used in the Five Ish Doctors. Yeah. What, what was it? Okay. Well, basically, it was um, obviously it comes where it comes in, in the in the scene, and. Uh, 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 the phone rings, uh, Tom picks it up and says, 
Ah, oh, how, how wonderful to hear from one of my former selves. Or oh, lesser, no, lesser selves, he says. Well, how, how wonderful to hear from one of my lesser selves. And then Colin proceeds to try and explain to him what we want him to do. And he just simply puts the, puts the phone down on the coffee table, pours himself another glass of wine, sips at it, then finally finishes, and then picks up the phone as Colin finishes explaining, having not heard a word, and says, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll jump, but I just can't be asked. And then puts the, phone, and then puts the phone down. And that was it, really. So he didn't really have to do, he could have done it very easily. <laughs> and it was quite funny. Anyway, there you go, he didn't do it. Well, uh, we want to thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. much. <laughs> so there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. I, if I, I, sir, I know we all had a blast being on the panel and listening to him talk. I hope you, listener, also had as much fun listening to it as we did and the audience and the crowd seemed to. I think one thing you might notice listening to that is um, he told a lot of great stories. He told a lot of good things about the past and the things that, that he knew and the questions that were asked. And he lit up mm. both days. We asked, mm. He was asked about the five-ish doctors. <laughs> and you could tell that he loves to talk about the five-ish doctors because he really did. He lit up. And he was like, oh, you want to talk about that? And in fact, the first day on the panel, he talked the most <laughs> on that. And he had the audience so engaged, and I think everybody was loving it. And in fact, that was one of my favorite moments on the he, panel. He got the most audience about. reactions really out did. of that story, really out of did. anything else. So that was a lot. And a lot thing. of people asking about it because they hadn't seen it either. Which uh, I was quite surprised me by. Me too. And I think I'm not so surprised now realizing, as he said, it's not available on the on DVDs, di- disc yeah. in the U.S. It is in the, in the U.K. Now, isn't it on the 50th? Isn't it's on it the on 50th feature, feature anniversary the, box set this, that he was referring this, this to. special edition. He said the Matt Smith box set. He was in, implying the 50th anniversary. But no, the, the actual set. day of no, the Doctor no, it's not, not a special on feature on there? Special feature. Is that where we were upset by that? Yes. Because yes. I remember <laughs> talking about it. Fact, Maybe that's, that's what it was. That's why I was hoping, because I kept holding off buying Day of the Doctor, because I was hoping that's the box set would release here, and we would have all of it. It is a special feature on that it is not available here, but it is on Vimeo, as he said. Now you can see it's still online. And I was I was taken aback that a lot of people hadn't seen that. On the flip side of that, after I'd thought about it, it's not readily available, and you do have to now search it out. So if you didn't see it th- yeah. three years ago now that it's been out, almost three years, two years, I suppose. No, it's been three because it was 2013. We're going to so, go through this again. Almost. Yeah, November almost, yet. yeah, well, almost. But three years ago. It, <laughs> 14, uh, no. 15, 16. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has been uh, three almost, years. Almost and three. there's a good chance that a lot of people there didn't see yeah. it. And so uh, hopefully well, now they will well, go and see he, it. And he was so great about it because after our interview and we kind of hung out a little bit and did other stuff, I went and got an, my autograph from him once he got back to his table. And he spent a decent amount of time with the person ahead of me trying to find out where he can get give her an address a website so she could go, go watch see it, it. Oh, okay. and he took time out to look up on his cell phone what is it there nope nope let's go here he's instead. so proud of it you can tell yeah and he, he, rightfully so because it is a wonderful piece and it's as i told him in the panel it said you know i watched the 50th anniversary special all the lead up to that I watched the 50th anniversary special and i couldn't think of anything that could have been better that was just such a wonderful moment and i thought nothing can get better than this to top this day and then that came out. Yeah. <laughs> and the day got so much better. <laughs> like that. And I genuinely mean that. I had as much fun with that as I did the 50th Absolutely. Anniversary. He's also very proud of his book. <laughs> he was very well, proud of I, his I think book. that a lot of that was also tongue in cheek. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. Which, yes, but no. Yeah, honestly, it's it made fun... me intrigued to go read the yeah, book. I think <laughs> it may, may be something we wind up putting on the schedule. Maybe, 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 maybe instead of, of a. Uh, book club. Maybe instead of Beyond the Doctor, we do Behind the Doctor. We start reading autobiographies. Well, actually, I think we had talked about three or four years ago when we started this about that being one of the things we could do is tackle the uh, the autobiographies that they've done. So, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of them out there, too. I mean, yeah. Almost all of the Doctors have one or a biography. So, Life Outside the Box, available on Amazon. An Actor's Despair. <laughs> he sold out of that book the first day. Yeah. yeah. He didn't have any by the panel time the next day. And I almost asked him, if I download it onto my Kindle, will you sign my Kindle? <laughs> and I should have, because he might have signed it for free. I just had him write it on the back. Anyway, um, so after that, we were famished. Because it was 2 o'clock, and none of us had eaten breakfast since like 9 a.m. Yeah. Me even earlier, because I ate on the road. <laughs> we were famished. So we did go get some dinner, 
and uh, we came back. And I think when we came back is when I went over and got uh, my you went uh, and got autograph. Your room. Well, I went oh. and got my autograph from. I did go get my room. I got checked in. Uh, that's when I got my autograph, and then um, that was all cosplay day, wasn't it? So Sean, actually, Sean and Mel had to meet us at dinner because you might tell this story. You had to get shy checked in for. Uh, costume yeah we were uh, of the opinion that we we thought uh, that uh, everything was going to be happening later for the the, the costume contest and uh, um, so i said well i'll go get the car and move it around i said why don't you go double check and find out do we need to check in because i know some costume contests you've got to pay to enter and different and i, I, I we didn't really know we just knew that we kind of wanted to enter shy mel had had this idea for a costume which probably by now most of you have seen online through our <laughs> facebook page um and we thought yeah go. now the initial thought was uh sill we were going to wrap her in kind of a big green slug outfit and she was going to go with sill and be pushed around in the cart which would have been great until um neil saban the actor that plays sill i cannot think of his name now that i've started that story he was originally a guest that was going to be a time eddie and he had to cancel so then that just kind of put oh well it doesn't really make sense to have sill show up when you know He's not going to be there because that kind of lost the magic. So instead, we did K nine, um, and um, oh, I, I I have first of all a retraction because I have kind of made a few tongue in cheek disparaging comments about cosplayers before, not in any real you know malice, but just with how it's uh, you know easy in some regards to throw a costume together. Boy, let me tell you, I take all of it back, and I'm so sorry. Because cosplayers, you, you you've always had that magical. I think what it is is I'm envious. I think you all pissed me off just a little bit because it's like, <laughs> wow, I really wish I could do something that was that amazing. Um, dealing with with canine on a soon to be ten month old uh, just was an exercise in futility. But uh, Mel went and uh, I, I went to get the car. Mel went to check in on that and came back and said, hey, it's now. They need to, they're doing prejudging now. We've got 20 minutes to get her in the costume and get her into the room. And so we said, well, you guys go ahead and go out to dinner. We'll meet you there. So uh, we went and got her and, and got shy and got her put together into the costume. And it was, you know, fairly awesome and got her into the room and pieces started falling off and <laughs> stickers went flying and things and we'd, we'd measured measure measure oh we measure twice cut once that's the adage right glenn you have a garage you know how this works we did all that and man these panels are i don't know it feels like three sizes too wide for um the hat look i thought the head looked a little too small and just i didn't understand why nothing dimension wise worked with what we had put together but uh, they, they thought she was adorable, and she was. She was the cutest thing ever. Um, so then uh, we went to dinner and then came back to be part of that. And they kind of told us, they said, we're going to line everybody up for the costume contest, but you don't have to be there at this time because, obviously, she's a kid. In fact, we're going to put you on last, which kind of right then told me, oh, she's going last. They're saving the best for last. Okay, I see how this is going to go. Um, and again, thank you to you guys and, and, and Sarah for kind of putting up with our shenanigans the rest of the day Saturday, because I know that wasn't, Oh, it wasn't, no. it was I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't arduous, no, I don't no, no, think, no. but it but was it just, was, it, it took away maybe from something else you maybe wanted to do is instead of hanging out with, with us and it cosplay didn't, stuff. It didn't necessarily, because I think by that time we, everything was after done. After lunch, we kind of went off and did our we own We did do our, our own things. Bit. In fact, I, at one point in the afternoon, went and sat in on a little bit of the big finish panel. They talked a little bit about Big Finish, and, and uh, the three guys up there were kind of... In fact, I was quite surprised that in that room, and I, I didn't stay the whole time, but in that room, there were quite a few people in there that had never heard Big Finish. And these three guys were doing a pretty good job training, you know, kind of convincing uh, people uh, about the series and being uh, um, advocates for the series. So I kind good. of I appreciated the fact that they did that panel. Um and I did that. I did, and I, again, I went. I wandered around the dealer's room again because I just I kept eyeing things that I wanted to buy and knew I didn't have the money for because I've got another vacation coming up this week. Uh, and got, I, that's when I got my chance to kind of do my thing and walk around and look at things. And so, uh, no, that that actually worked out really well. Sarah and I got to go up to the room and kind of relax a little bit, and then I was able to change into my costume. Yeah. Um, I came. Which got, one? <laughs> 
Back on the eleventh doctor. Back on the eleventh doctor. Which the tight pants didn't seem as tight. I think I grabbed a different pair. Or you've lost some weight. Well, it was in the legs, so my ankles lost weight. Oh, because <laughs> I remember the tight hey. pants being tight around the. When ankle. you look, when you look like me, you take loss anywhere you want, or anywhere you possibly can take it. Because they were not tight around the waist. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but that being said, then we filtered in because at that point they were doing the because they were attempting the Guinness World Record for most. Uh, Doctor Who cosplayers in one location, which um, went on quite a while, but it was, that was kind of fun because there were people that you could tell weren't going to be in the costume contest, but were a part of this event. And so Keith and Sarah and I went in there and sat and watched that while which, you guys were still getting shy ready because that and well and, and Keith was involved in that and we went and that was nice yeah, to be able to I, watch. I was part of it. That's why I did the costume. Oh, that's right. You were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have this shocked look on my face. Like, what did you do for that? <laughs> oh yeah, you were dressed up. He walked up. <laughs> <laughs> held a board with his number on it and, and said, said who he was. was. <laughs> Which was also really cool because if there were some characters you weren't entirely sure who they were, you, uh, got, to, you uh, got to know. And that, in fact, that's why I liked sitting in there. That, yeah, me too. That. Now, that were you said, molested by a fangirl in Wichita? I was not. <laughs> that being <laughs> said, Sarah. that did go on forever, but they did a lot an hour for it, and Keith made a good point. It now, was only 30, uh, 35 minutes. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we did not get the record. Uh, we were about 300 shy. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I'm glad they attempted it. You know, we were almost 400. We were 400. Because it was 490 four, something, isn't it? Was the, and we got to 90 something, I think. So. Yeah. It was, almost four, like it was about 400, uh, 400 shy. That being said, I'm glad they attempted it. And it was but something a lot that of fantastic costumes to were. watch and see uh, parade. Did you have any favorites from those, Glenn? I, I really, this is this is so silly. And I even, I, I caught her and told her. I, and I, I, I complimented her on it because... There was a woman that was walking around in a bathrobe in her bare feet. This is white fuzzy, not even fuzzy, but fluffy bath, bathrobe. And I had seen her when she came in, and I thought, what is this woman doing? <laughs> she got in line, and she got up there, and she says, and she pulls the, the bathrobe back a bit, and she says, I'm Jackie Tyler. And I went, it so is Jackie <laughs> Tyler. <laughs> So I was amazed by that. I said, how simple of a costume and easy. And in fact, when she came around and I said, that was great. Because that was, the, because you, you get the, you get the doctors, you get the companions, you get, and they all do a wonderful job and they really do up this costume. And it was the simplicity of hers that she was, she even told me, she said, you know, I was sitting there and we were talking about the cosplay thing. It's just, I was in this bathrobe when I went, aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> And I thought, I never would have thought of something like that. You could do a Tenth Doctor in his pajamas. Yeah. You, you could do, I've, I've seen some you could do, do Donna in her bathrobe from Midnight. Yep. Yeah, there's all kinds of opportunities for... The uh, Master from... He said Search for the End of Time, but The End of Time was a, was a clever one, too. It was another simple. aha. He had a black hoodie... With black red jeans shirt. and a red shirt. <laughs> Piece and of cake. Like, I'm the master from the end of time. And I thought, okay, I'm so cosplaying now because I can totally do that. <laughs> well, and there was the guy that I saw last year that I wasn't quite sure. He was in a tux and had a glass of champagne. And then, oh, he's the jerk from Voyage of the Dam. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was he the, the jerk from the Voyage of the Dam? Yeah, that's Oh, I thought he was from the God Complex. I believe he was the ventriloquist guy. No. That's what I thought the whole time. Oh, that would work too. But but yeah, you're right. Okay. (laughs) That's what he said then and during your cosplay contest. I completely forgot about that. There was a great war lord. Now I'm. War war lord, yeah. Yeah, war lord from the war games was fantastic with the glasses and everything. And the kind of a turtleneck black. Which, another pretty simple costume yeah, because it's, it's a black simple. turtleneck and je- black pants. Yeah. Piece of cake. Now, and sometimes it, unless you, like that one I probably would have saw and gone, okay, I think that's probably once, who that is. Once I saw the glasses, I realized, yeah. oh, When uh-huh. they get up there, though, in, in that kind of setting and they say who they are, then you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, nice, nice, good, nice shot. Because a bathroom lady, I never would have figured <laughs> out until she said it. Um, and the Draven. I was so impressed with Draven. The Draven was cool. I, I saw her up there and I said, there's a Draven. Somebody's doing a Draven. This is great. And uh, she trundled around and came out and went out the door. And I was like, ah. And so I told Keith, so i got to get a picture of that Draven. <laughs> and I waited and waited. And she never came back. And I thought, okay. So I actually walked out into the, the main area, the, the the main atrium. And I looked for her and I looked for her and I couldn't find her. And I came back in and I sat down. And, and uh, it wasn't until the costume contest that she came back in and she did her thing. And I was like, oh, good. So I got snapped a picture of her on stage. 
But then I went out to go to the bathroom, which was just on those doors on the other side. As I came out, she was coming through, and I said, I got to get your picture. I got to get your picture. So I was very impressed with that. I was, I, yeah. I was very impressed with the idea that people are dipping back into these lesser known characters and doing especially these, from a lost story yeah, yeah but doing something that was as familiar to me as a Draven because it wasn't the simplistic of throwing a bathrobe on or throwing a yeah. hoodie on it, it was a work. she had completely her and her mother had completely constructed this dress and she you know she she was fussing with the way she's the wig's just not quite right i said it's it works it works she great. had the dots it's, around her she eyes did. she had the oh, dots yeah. right above her I eyes mean. she had she had the gun and she was she even had the pose whenever they would <laughs> point the gun I mean, I mean very feminine pose but i mean and not very imposing but um yeah she just she had it she had it down and i was like uh high marks for that because she did a good job and, and the guy who dressed as the kinda uh, Kinder Warrior. Yeah. Kinder Warrior worshiper. Yeah, yeah. He, he did a great job, too. The, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? Buckskin uh, skirt. <laughs> yeah. And then the things across, you know, the sticks across that kind of... The necklace type like a thing. necklace yeah. slash vest. Yeah. Uh, that was good. Um, it was great to see how many classic era costumes there yeah, were. Yeah. There was even a Nissa. There was a Which Nissa, was yeah. fantastic. Oh, her dress was terrific. Yeah. She had, the, she had the Nissa dress, you know, the Nissa of Tarkin dress. The red velvet. Yeah. 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 So yeah. good, so good. Um, I think we all fell in love with the uh, uh, War Doctor. Little that, War Doctor. He was probably, what, <laughs> five, six years old? Six, he, maybe he, seven. He was, he was back, backstage. They had everybody lined up in that hall. Uh, and, I, and I don't mean hall like a grand big hall. No, I mean like a narrow hallway. And they had everybody lined up. And... Um, that kind of put us over in the little I don't know, antium where the, the pop machine was. Mm-hmm. So everybody's lined up there. And then this war doctor walks by and he, he how old? Seven? He must have been six or seven. Six or seven. seven. And he walks by and he's the spitting image of the war doctor. <laughs> His hair is all tousled up. He's got the fake beard. It's all makeup. And he's got this great outfit. And it's just like, wow, that is awesome. And he saw Shy. And stopped and came and sat down and played with her Aww. for a good half hour <laughs> while we were waiting to go out. And just, you know, he had his, his, his Sonic out and he was waving it and she was just mesmerized with this. And, <laughs> you know, she would reach out and try and take it and he would let her have it for a little bit and then she'd give it back to him. They just struck up this report. And before long, his parents came by to find out what happened to our kid. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got to talk with them for a little bit. And it just, he, uh, all the way from uh, New Mexico. Oh, wow. All the way from New Mexico they came for this convention. Okay. And uh, I, I saw today he was dressed as the empty child. Oh, was that him? Oh, I yeah. did see a little... Uh, I saw him take his mask off and... Uh, oh, it's the war doctor. Okay. Right. But, but, he, but he was just great. Um, the caretaker. Oh, yes. No, no, no. The curator. The curator. The curator. <laughs> Why do I keep saying caretaker? The curator. Because the doctor was a caretaker. Oh, wait. The doctor might have been a curator, too. <laughs> um, we went to breakfast Saturday morning. And there's this guy in the restaurant. And out of the corner of my eye, Mel starts ribbing me. And I turn and look. And it's like, is that Tom Baker? That looks like Tom Baker. His hair, he cut his hair. What is- his hair's even white. <laughs> and I would stare at him and go, no, it's not Tom Baker. Okay, it's just a guy that looks like Tom Baker. Oh, yeah, there were at least costumes were just so amazing. Um, after that, well, we should say before the judging, they did do the cosplay ball, which was interesting because there was a lot of people, and I think most of them were just waiting, but that was a nice time for everybody to kind of stand in there and mingle. I think they yeah. intended for people to dance. They didn't dance, but <laughs> uh, there were a few people, you know, moving back and forth, but it was a good idea. It was a good concept. Um, and following the cosplay contest was uh, a concert with Dominic Glenn. Dominic Glenn. He came in and, and did some things. Now, we, sadly, I, I think we all kind of, we wanted to, wanted stick, to stick around, but it was again our schedule had been so skewed by that time we hadn't eaten any dinner. We we had planned on doing dinner between world record and cosplay Correct. contest, or even before that, and it just didn't. It happen. got away from us, and in fact, it, it unfortunately encroached on our plans because we had intended to go set with Ben in his room. Ben Buckles, friend of the show, and uh, he he invited us to his room last year, and we had tea and and had some chat. We, we wanted to do that again this year. Unfortunately, we hadn't eaten yet, and we were afraid by the time we ate, which was almost 9 o'clock by the time we went to yeah. eat, we were afraid by the time we get back it'd be so late. So unfortunately, we didn't even get a chance to sit, uh, sit down with uh, Ben and, and t- chat with him, we, who, we, who had a very good panel on 
Friday, which we unfortunately missed. Unfortunately, it sounds like he didn't get the turnout that he kind of wanted or yeah. expected. There were a few Plus, hiccups along with that, yeah. but good news. I'm not going to say it, but uh, if for you listeners, we may have something. We may uh, have something on pipeline that'll uh, we may give have something everybody special a chance for that. to share that. So yeah. Um, so we went to dinner, and then after that, I think we all came back and said, "Okay, good night." Because <laughs> we were all <laughs> we went to bed days. and crashed. Uh, next morning we got up, and our first round for the morning was we had a panel. We, we had, of course, had breakfast. We made sure we had breakfast, <laughs> which we had something <laughs> in our stomach, not knowing what our day was going to be. No, we, we kind of knew what our day was going to be. Well, um, so uh, <laughs> what we did is we, we went down and we actually did our scheduled uh, Karen, uh, Karen, Caitlin Blackwood panel and uh, chatted with her. And we kind of mixed things up because we had done, we in the past, overall, we've done two panels with her, but we had just done yeah, this the day before. Yeah, this is our third panel with her. We mixed it up, and we did a little thing. We actually stole this from uh, a friend of ours, Kirk Creighton, who did this at uh, Planet Comic Con with Karen Gillen, is we did a little bit of word association. And the purpose of that was to give her some words that we could kind of springboard off and talk about topics. And I think that went fairly well. I think so, too. I think she kind of appreciated it, too, because it was different. It was a different approach of doing doing a panel with her. And, and Especially with the same people who moderated it for the day yeah. before. Luckily, having done a panel with her the day before, we could load the words. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, she had chatted about uh, somebody. I think somebody had asked her about haggis. We didn't. Somebody in the audience had brought it up, right? Yeah. And she said she didn't like it. Oh, it's gross, <laughs> disgusting. And we had this this fun little conversation with her afterwards. And so when we decided to come up with the word association, we planted that. We planted tea. And we and Sean she had a great idea because he said the first day, I wish you'd ask her about what she thought about marmite. So I thought, well, there we go. So we put marmite <laughs> in there, which was a lot of fun. And again, we had a nice little chat with her. And it looked like the crowd was decently she had a, a different I think crowd. she had a slightly different crowd this time. Yeah, there I wasn't think so as too. many kids this time. No, I th- um, but still a lot of good questions. And I think I noticed the questions coming out today were more of the wanting to get to know her type. Yes. And they were wondering yes. her aspirations and her what she kind of so it was it was a different type of questions from the crowd, which I liked as well. Um after that, straight after that at eleven o'clock was uh our panel with Anakin Wills. And uh we put Sean on point on that one. And uh, what a lovely lady. Oh. She, just from the moment she came up to us to introduce ourselves, it was just, she was so gracious and so, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, she was, you could tell she was having a blast. She was an absolute joy to talk to. She was a joy to have at the convention. She was the epitome of good guest. Oh, yeah. I mean, just top to bottom, left front to back, whatever you would want for her in a in a guest. She was there. She was gracious. She was welcoming. She was funny. Uh, she was having a blast. She was just off and off doing her own thing. <laughs> she did. She she really. In fact, she sat in on the on the second Peter panel. She did. did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. She was. She was. She was just a joy and a hoot. Oh, oh she yeah. Was. A little crazy, but so you know. <laughs> I, I mean that in an endearing. You know. No, absolutely. She's so great. No, no it just she's such an eclectic type of person too. She has this wonderful personality and. And as she'll t- we'll talk a little bit about the panel. She actually, she did acting in the 60s, and she gave it up. She In the 1970s, she decided she wanted to raise a family, and she wanted to live out. Um, she just kind of lives out in the country and has, you know, for many years. And, and they were kind of, I don't want to say reclusive. They weren't. They, but they, they didn't have television. They didn't have phones. They didn't, well, computers, things like that. They, they kind of lived off the land. She wanted to garden. She wanted to raise her kids. And I really respect and admire her for that. Yeah. Or, um, but... Wonderful stories she had to tell about. Another great storyteller. And she had had a panel the day before. And in fact, John Peel, the author, had moderated that panel. And I think that was more of a Annika as a person type panel. And so what I think we did is we tried to drill it down to Polly. Because that's, in fact, it was billed in the in the thing as Polly. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of, I think we took the approach to, to kind of steer towards the Polly questions, which I think we stayed on task. She did yeah. talk a little about, about her life and... and the time but it, it, it was really fun to hear some of those insights about. and you know it's interesting when i was doing some research on her i didn't realize that she was married to michael gal mm-hmm. th- yeah. that he was her first husband and i found that out and I went, oh wow and i kind of in the back of my head maybe was there was a question somewhere buried in that but then i was like i'm ah, quite I, sure whether uh, to how do how, yeah how do you get around that <laughs> she brought it right up <laughs> well and then i had forgotten I, it was just one of those things that I sat on it for so long. I just filed it away and didn't think about it anymore. And then she brought it on the panel. Oh my, you know, Michael Gow. And I, went, oh yeah, I was going to ask you something about that. <laughs> so 
But, but yeah. lovely woman, and we're not going to drone on about that panel because we have another little treat for you in this episode. We're going to actually um, give you that panel here to take a listen to. So uh, here it is. First of all, we want to say um, welcome to uh, Monica Wills, and uh, she played with Polly. Uh, Polly Wright comes off the too. Um, and just, first of all, I, this is kind of the obligatory question you ask everybody. Yeah. What brought you to acting? How did you get into acting? Well, almost as soon as I popped out, <laughs> I was um, I wrote, directed, and starred in a play I wrote called Evil Eye the Witch when I was nine. And I got notices in the local paper. So, you know, so what I feel is that... Um, it's it's a you see because I live on all these different levels and those who know me know that this is how it is. So I think I was an actor for many many lifetimes. You see, and you pop in this time and you say, right, I better get on with it then. Where am I, where's my script? You know. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, I was up on a panel with Terry Malloy and another actor, and the question was, if you could live in another time, where would you? And we all had to write it down, and we all wrote the same thing. We all said the Globe Theatre in Elizabethan times. So I have a feeling that that might have been one of the other lives. <laughs> and then, of course, um, that brings you to Doctor Who. Uh, what, um, what was it that got you cast in Doctor Who? Well, um, n- not to be, you know, sort of showy-offy or whatever, um, but by 1966, I'd been working um, for the Beeb since I was... Um, 14. So and so by the time it got to 1966 I would come up on the list cuz because always oh, the best. <laughs> no, I, you know, because I had done a lot of really big plays and and now you would say starred, but in those days you would say leading role in. So of course when they want um, a a pretty lo- you know, I would say eyelashes longer than my skirt. Um, they my name would come up so that would that would happen. <laughs> Did you have any input on starting the character of Polly? Not much, um, because um, in those days, because of the schedule and because of the money, um, you, you, there were no discussions in you pop. They said, "Right, here you are. This is this is what it is, and here's the story." And okay, on you go. Um, so there was an error. But so what you do is you do the best you can to do to bring in all the magic that you can, you know. And I must tell you, because there's this one moment. I know I've said it yesterday, but never mind. There's this one moment when you see the war machines, and so there I am, and. Professor Brett says to the doctor, and this is my secretary, she's very smart, and the camera goes to me, looking gorgeous, I had this <laughs> lovely dress, and, um, and the doctor says, the doctor says, hmm, and he eyes me up, <laughs> and I've only just saw that the other day, because I watched it, because I don't usually watch myself, um, and oh yeah, William Hartnell's going, hmm, <laughs> so there we are. Well, I think Polly kind of sets a blueprint for the companion going forward because yes. she was set from the modern day and yes. a bit more of your every woman. Yes. What do you think of that yes. tradition continuing? Yes. Ah, well, it's brilliant, and of course it's growing on. And so, thank goodness, I wasn't going to be a sort of wimpy, you know, um, not being able to manage. So, so the, so yeah, there was a character description. It said, um, it said, um, intelligent. And I'm procreative, so I would be immediately, I mean, almost immediately, we're saying, well, we've got to protect the doctor. Me and Mike, you know, we've got to protect the doctor. What's happening? So immediately we're part of, we're not sort of hanging back. So, um, yes, and that, and that character was created, actually, by Kit Pedler. Um, because he was the scientist who created the Cybermen. And he definite, he and his wife were very um, keen on women being in the workplace, women being in charge, women, you know. So they wanted absolutely to have a character. So in a way, that w- it was their influence that, that helped Polly to be who Polly was. But I had already been playing people who were, you know, <laughs> driving men mad. <laughs> I think it's very evident. Uh, I also just watched the War Machines again recently, yes. and I was struck. Obviously, you are what uh, Ben terms a posh bird. A posh bird. He's a posh bird. Uh, and still looking fantastic. 
But Polly immediately steps forward and has moments throughout the serial that don't fall into typical, oh, I'm a screaming companion uh, kind of uh, role. I mean, she, she's proactive. She's out there with the doctor. She's doing things. She's concerned when, you know, Dodo disappears. She's wanting to... I wasn't too concerned. concerned. <laughs> oh, sorry, darling. You, you, you leaving? Right. I'm in. <laughs> no, no. Go on. No, I, just, I like what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, as he said, it's something that I think you, you can tell that the interest was there and maybe the show, what was it, a year? Had been on at that point? Say, say, how long, How long had the show been on at that point? It was Ooh, what, three, 20, three, three, three seasons? Three seasons, yeah. Okay. Three seasons, yeah. Um, and it seemed like they were already interested in maybe trying to push that bar a little further forward. Yes. Four roles for women and yes. something a little different yes. than what had come before. So then also that, that would be very much a thing of the time, you know, um, in that moment of time. And it was quite within a few years, the writing for women was, was, um, was changing. And the BBC got these very good um, young authors who were um, asked to do, to do plays, and I was in a lot of them, um, where, where it starts to change because we've come out of the 50s. We're moving just, you know, and the 60s, we're just... It's the Beatles, you know, Doctor Who... The Beatles, Kennedy being shot, it all happened at the same time. Um, and there, that's the moment when hi historically things begin to change. And so, yeah, then, then so lovely because Doctor Who will be right in there having it different. And you sort of came in on the end of an era with William Hartnell, it was his last two stories. Yes. Um, he was obviously from, we've seen the. Uh, an adventure in time and space kind of documents the time of William Hartnell. Which was pretty inaccurate, I have to say. That's what I was going to ask, because I know that there's a lot of statements that he was, he was growing ill at the time, and it was yeah. one of the reasons he left. I was going to ask, how much of that is, is true, and was it a struggle working with him, or was it a just kind of an everyday thing? No, no. Um, so, so w when I got the part, then um, my old hubby, my ancient old hubby, um, who'd played the celestial toy maker, he said, watch out for Bill. Um, first of all, he's difficult. Um, he's very tetchy and he can lose his temper. So, you know, so don't go throwing your weight around, you know, because he knew what I was like. Um, and also... Um, he said, I have a feeling he's not very well. So that, that d beastly disease had started way back. It was coming. So you didn't know at the time that, that this, these would be uh, William Harrell's last two stories? No, no idea. You know, this is the beginning of our ten... Is it the word tenure? Is that a good word? On Doctor Who, you know. And of course, as you know, young actors, you just want the work. You want to keep it... You know, you want it to keep going. Um, so it became difficult. But I just want to say that... When I watched um, the, 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 the reconstruction of the smugglers um, just recently, uh, there you see, actually, we are actually being really kind and loving to Bill, in fact, because he actually was very likable. He was likable, and he was very talented, and he was the doctor, you know, so even if he had his little sides which were tricky... You know, you loved him, and you took care of him. And as he became more and more frail, then we took care of him more. And also because he'd forget his lines, and he'd say, no, it's your line. I'd say, no, actually, darling, it's your line, you know. But I can do it if you like. <laughs> you know, so like that. So was there a little bit of relief because of all the issues that... Patrick Troughton came in, or were you a little... It was, was it more bittersweet that, oh, we've kind of grown to like William Hartnell, and now he's leaving us? It's a good question, because it actually was a relief. But at the same time, um, you know, you thought, okay, we're going to... It's, the doctor's going to completely change. We had a summer break. By the, by the end of the summer, we knew that by the, by the beginning of the autumn, we were going to have a different doctor. And then during that summer, we were thinking... Well, now, this is interesting, because will the public accept it? You know, because it's not going to be a sort of look, a William Hartnell look-alike. It's going to be a completely different actor. Now, this had never been done before. Again, bottom line, you know, ordinary old actors thinking, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope we're going to be in work. You know, that, that's what you were thinking of. Um, and then, can I go on? Is it all right? Yeah, so then, um, we, we 
heard then that it was going to be Patrick Troughton, um, I wasn't sure if... In those days, you couldn't go, oh, Patrick Troughton, oh, yeah, oh, and he's done... You couldn't do that. So I think... I'm not sure if I'd seen him before. I I must... I, I knew the name. I couldn't quite remember. So I love to tell you this story because I love going back. I'll take you, and I love going back myself to the moment in um, St. Helen's Church Hall, and it's a lovely morning like today, um, autumnal morning, and um, we're all excited, and we're waiting for Patrick to come, and we're all, you know, kind of on tenterhooks. And then these red-painted swing doors fly open, and in comes Patrick. He's quite little and looking so dear and with a little Greek bag over his shoulder and a red cardi and he walks in like, you know, and we all go, yay! And the, all of us were on our feet and we are cheering. And then it's, okay, let's get to work. And obviously the fans or the uh, viewers kind of accepted Patrick and it went on. Thank God, you see, because if it hadn't been Patrick, I don't think we'd be sitting here today, 50 years later, talking about it. He just was the right, absolutely. You, he was so lovable. You couldn't, you couldn't, you know, you, could, you weren't going to, to be upset by this, really. So it was a good choice, very good choice. In hindsight, I imagine it's, you probably still have that moment of, God, we're still talking about this show 50 years later, especially now. You were there for the first for generation. It's yes. commonplace now. We're used to it. This was a big deal. It was, was big not deal. just a thing. This was the first time that this had been done. Other than the worry or the, the, you know, the viewers going to accept the change, was there other things, uh, maybe aside from the acting uh, concerns? Am I still going to have a job tomorrow? But were you yeah. thinking within the confines of the show? Or can you look back on it now and still kind of just... I can't believe that worked. Yes, I think it is I can't believe that worked. But as I say, it was all down to Patrick. And also, um, you know, the, the, the producers sometimes were, were, re- sometimes were really um, inspired and they thought, okay, if it's wobbly, better bring the Daleks in. <laughs> you know, that, that's always, that always works, you know. You know. So, um, so there was a lot, there, there was an amazing amount of energy from everybody, producers, writers, the actors, the, the floor men, everybody. They, because this had been such a popular show, we don't want to lose it. We want to make this work. And that was an amazing pressure on Patrick, actually. He really, he really felt the burden of the responsibility of, you know, he didn't want it to die on his shoulders, you know. So we were all, I think, we were all gunning for it. That was the energy that was going on at the time. And then, of course, we had the, um, the, the, the changeover from Bill. And people always say, you know, oh, was there a big party for Bill and everything? Um, and there wasn't because he wasn't well. And so we weren't going to be saying, yeah, you know, get rid of it. We weren't, we weren't. Patrick was very polite with him, and everybody was, you know, being really sensitive. And then we did, we did the filming with the changing of the face. And then that was done, and Bill was taken with his carer then into a car and driven quietly home. And we, again, we didn't say, right, okay, let's get on. No, no, we, you know, sensitive. We were sensitive. All of us were, you know. But at the same time, it was like, all right, let's get on with it, <laughs> you know. Well, let's talk about that first story with Patrick Trout and Power of the Daleks, which is just going to come out animated. I, what do you yeah, remember making I that? Know. I have to just say the little thing, because I love this, in Doctor Who magazine, because this is what they said. The Power of the Daleks being animated is the most ambitious Doctor Who archive restoration animation ever attempted. Well, that, that to be said, there are a good number of stories that you're in that are still missing. Yeah. And so what's it like to be able to go back and have people get to see now some sort of version of Power of the Daleks? Said a lot, some, there, there are still a lot of people that aren't even familiar that much with the story because the only thing that exists is the reconstruction. Reconstruction. Like? Um, well, um, I mean, the thing, the thing about it, of course, is that it's the one story that people always ask me about because it was the most important, you know, because this was... This was the moment when 
the whole, the whole mystique of Doctor Who began in a way. So, so without that story, without Patrick Troughton, we wouldn't be sit. So how important you can't you can't say how important that story was. Um, and I, I've only seen a little like you. I've only seen what you've seen. I haven't seen it yet. And I saw on somebody's mobile the little bit. I got goosebumps. So to me, that is portentous. That's a good word. Portentous. I think they've pulled it out of the hat, and I think it's going to be brilliant. And I love the way that the BBC have caught on to the magic finally. Um, you know, and they're going to be putting it out Saturday afternoon, 5:30, at the very time that it would have gone out. You have been a bit of an ambassador for Doctor Who because you stopped acting in 1970. Is that correct? Yeah. And kind of just went into motherhood and. and homemaker and things like that, right? Yeah. But it, you have come back to Doctor Who in that you have done um, some Big Finish audios. Oh, yeah. And you've done uh, BBC DVD commentaries. Yeah. What is it about Doctor Who that brings you back that you still come back, and, and conventions obviously, connecting with the fans? What is it specific that brings you back to Doctor Who? Of all the things that you've done, what brings you back to Doctor Who? Well, <laughs> because we're a family. It's my family. I, I'm actually a sort of orphan. I live on my own. And I don't, you know, I don't get out much, <laughs> except coming to places like Kansas. But um, so the first, the first time it was Stephen James Walker called up, and it was '93, wasn't it? It was the 30th, and um, and I had, oh, I hadn't, I hadn't thought or talked about Doctor Who. I'd moved along and I'd been doing other things. But I must tell you, because I am a bit magic. <laughs> um, when Patrick Troughton died, and I hadn't, I never was in touch with him at all, I didn't, you know, after being in the show. Um, one night, I'm asleep, I have a very strong dream, there's little Patrick saying, hello darling, and I go, oh, my old Patrick, oh, amazing. And in the morning, I'm thinking, oh, darling Patrick, I wonder where in the world he is, and those times, that was so amazing, and you know, and I was really, I was out on this little tiny island in the middle of nowhere. Phone goes, friend in England, who says, do you know, Annika, that Patrick Troughton died last night? So I thought, well, there you are, see. And he's been with me ever since, actually. So that's that connection. And then they're calling up and saying, um, Stephen James Walker, and we did the big. And he was reminding me, because I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten so much. Of course you do. So will you come back to England? I said, yeah, you're going to pay my fare. Yeah, I'll come back. It'll be really good. So we did the first one, 93, and it was in, and I met Mike again at the station. And it was so amazing because there he was, dear thing, looking so sweet. He says, hello, Duchess. It was, you know, no time had gone. And we got on the train and we were gossiping away about Fraser. We always used to like to tease Fraser. <laughs> and um, then I got to the... But I was a bit worried, I was a bit scared, because I thought, who are these weird people who are Doctor Who fans? Oh, you know, this is so weird, you know, I don't know. And then, then, of course, there's Gary Russell, there's, you know, all lovely people, John Pertwee was there. Um, and then I had to walk down, I was, I was absolutely sweating with fear, I had to walk down the centre of this, this room, and there were about sort of 500 people. And, and as I walked down, they all had their flashes. I felt like a star. <laughs> and I just felt right at home. And um, so then, after a little bit of, bit of time doing lots of the conventions, and by now, um, what I w want to say all the time, and to the press and so forth, and I will when I do my press, what's it, is to say, you know, in the dark times when there was no Doctor Who, Big Finish and the fans were what kept it going. So as much as we enjoy doing it, without you guys, we wouldn't be doing it either, you know. So it was the fans that kept it alive. And also, it's not just fans, it's friends, you know. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Big Finish, because you've done a few of the companion chronicles, you've done some of the early adventures they've done. Was it easy to find the character again? Because I've listened to some of them, and they're wonderful. They're, they're very, it, you, you can't believe that you've skipped a beat so many years between. It, was it easy to find that character again, or did you struggle to find it? Absolutely not. It was like putting on a pair of jeans that still fitted you. you went, oh, yeah, I'm still in them. <laughs> you know, this is good. 
absolutely easy as, easy as pie. And now that we have this um, friend called Elliot who's um, playing Ben, you know, th- I can't tell you how spooky that was because I had been doing, I did, well, can't remember, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> did a lot of commentaries and so then you're watching and, and then and playing and just playing Polly and then, um, and then doing all the voices. Then they say, okay, we've got someone to do Ben. And then that was a bit dodgy because I know that a lot of the fans would say, oh, no, you can't have somebody do, uh, somebody else doing uh. So here comes Elliot, and we were impressed because he came into the, into the little Big Finish um, studio, and he had piles of notes, you know. And he said, no, no, I can't touch that. He, he said, no, no, I've got, it, I've got his voice on my mobile, so I'm absolutely with him. And I've made notes of how he did this. And he was in absolute awe of, Be- of Michael Craze. So we like that. <laughs> that, that. That stood well. Okay, then we all go into our little booths, and Fraser is over in this one, and he's so good because he does Jamie, and then he does the Doctor, and when he does the Doctor, he puffs out his little chest, ooh, 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 <coughs> and he does his little cough. So he's brilliant. Then we have Elliot is here. He's going to be reading Ben, me, and then the characters who are going to be with us, the different people. So we start... And, and Lisa, the producer, says, ha, ha, hang on, we, we've got to stop. We've got to stop. Said, Why? What's, what's the matter? She said, actually, we've just got to take a break. We've all got goosebumps. This is so amazing. And then we went on, and Elliot has got him down. So for me, now, here I am working again with a doctor, with Jamie, with Ben, and, and you know, and lovely stories and I get paid for it. How marvellous is that? I mean, also in my old age, because mostly old actresses, you know, you don't get the work. So this is magic. And once again, I'm just completely grateful to everybody who did it. You're doing a brilliant job, and I must must say I'm Ah. very impressed. Um, Let's step back to Michael Craze, because we didn't talk much about him who played Ben in the series. Um, What was it like working with him, and did you guys have a good working relationship? We were... Absolutely the best of friends. Um, he was... Oh, it might even make me cry how much I loved him and how talented he was and how beautiful he was. He was so beautiful. Um, and because, I think in a way, because we came in and, and William Hartnell was ill and so we had this tricky situation, we supported each other, so we immediately bonded and became very supportive. I just want to say, because when I was up here yesterday, and we saw the moment in the 10th planet when he's showing the cancel, you know, that film, that was so brilliant. Um, and I want to watch that again, because the camera goes back to him, and he's, is he looking sad because the cyber, he's killed the Cyberman? He, he suddenly got an expression, you see, and that actually is reveals the sweet vulnerability of Ben. He had why he didn't become a great big film star. I don't know because he had it, you know. And actually, when they came and said, "Look, we're going to get rid of Mike," and then, "Would you like to go on with Fraser?" I thought it was the most short-sighted thing that they could possibly do. And I also thought, there's no way I could go on with Fraser. It would seem so disloyal to my mate, you know, to say, oh, well, sorry, darling, I'm going to go on with Fraser. No, I couldn't do it. So we both left. How how did Fraser change the dynamic once he joined the team? How did he... Change the the dynamic? Well, in a way he did, because, because if you have three companions, it's tricky because there's only so much dialogue that you can do. Um, so in, uh, uh, is it in the moon base? We, we put him to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he does. I mean, he had some wonderful lines. Then he does. What was the wonderful line um, about the beastie? What was oh, it? Piper. Oh, it's the phantom paper. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was a hoot. Of course he was a hoot. And we enjoyed his company. But I think for Michael it was more difficult because he did feel, you know, I'm not, I don't have the lines now, you know. So, um, so it, was an, it began to be awkward. Yeah. I think for me one of my favorite things about the animation uh, that's coming out with these is it gives me a chance because I, I love Doctor Who. I love it. 
I'm not as well steeped in some of the classic episodes as I would like to be yes. because so many of them are missing. Yes. And the recons are there, and I appreciate the fact that at least we have that. Yes. But I also find them challenging to watch. I, I tend to be a little more critical of how they're put together, and I, I can't seem to get past that and just get into the story. So when I can sit down and, and, and watch it, and it's got the animation to it, it suddenly opens up this whole new... Yes. You know, this is... I'm watching an episode of Doctor Who that I've never seen before. And with the release of the uh, Tenth Planet in particular, and, or uh, the Moonbase, Moonbase is one of my favorite stories now. And it's because of the relationship that you and Ben have, oh. and how that progresses throughout that story. You guys are just wonderful. Thank and, you. And it just, it's Thank so you. heartening to me to see that more of this stuff is coming. Yes. Because I'm going to get more of it. Ooh, well, what are they going to animate next? Oh, we mustn't be greedy. <laughs> oh, why not? <laughs> Do you have something that you do? You know? Ah, the smugglers. <laughs> I want to see the smugglers because it was such a strong story. It was a strong story, and uh, you know, you know, I just went back there. Did you? Did you all get that on the? Yes, I know. I didn't want to say anything. I just thought we'd just suddenly pop up the pictures, and you'd just get me walking down on the beach because you would all get it. Oh, Ian. <laughs> But Matt sort of put that little thing. And then afterwards, we went up the hill to the pub, because there is the pub there where we must have stayed. So we, we went up there, and then I went in. It's, it's a lovely pub. It's an old 18th century pub in Cornwall. And, um, and it is absolutely as it was in the day, which is really interesting, because most of the lovely old pubs in England have turned into wine bars or you know, into you know, eateries. So I went up to the landlord, and I said, um, how long have you been here? And he said, oh, about 18 years. And I said, he said, but the, the, the one before was there since the 60s. And I said, oh, um, because, you know, we did a bit of filming, you know, here for Doctor Who. He said, it was so lovely. He said, oh, yeah, that's right, the Doctor Who crew, they came down here. They stayed here in the pub. That's part of the history of the place. We often tell people, and I say, oh, that's nice. I was actually there. He said, oh, yeah, are, are you drinking or what? <laughs> he didn't get He didn't get it. <laughs> I wasn't going to push it. But it was amazing. But it was, that was lovely. Your first time back. In first time years. back. First time back. But the, the pictures are amazing. And there's the cave, you know, that was so amazing. So the smugglers would be one, but the Highlanders also would be lovely, lovely. Uh, we, Mike and I and Patrick really love doing the historicals. We like doing the historicals. Um, and then, of course, we love the other ones as well. We didn't love the macro much, terror much, and we hated the fish people. Well, it was called the fish. We called it the fish people. Underwater menace. We didn't like that. Why, why didn't you like the underwater menace? Well, the thing was that this was, was it Patrick's ooh, 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 third story? But and, anyway, it was a story which, when he read it, um, when he read the script, he said, oh, God, this is a dog. <laughs> what are we going to do with this? And he was worried because he thought... We don't need a not very good story. He, he, you know, he'd only just, he was still very anxious and didn't feel secure. And so he wanted really good stories and he didn't think this was a very good story. And when we saw the filming that they'd done in Ealing, we, you always do the film, filming before. So we watched that bit of filming and we saw these people in their leotards with zips up the back. He, he, you know, he, it was confirmed this was a dog. <laughs> How are we going to get around this, you know? So, yeah. And then you talked a little bit about Micro Terra. Was that another situation where you guys come into it and you look at it and you think, is this going to work? Yes, exactly. You know, and, and that weird kind of... I, I've just done the reading for the Micro Terra. Um, and it was tricky because when I listened to it, um, it, was, it was all male voices. You know, it's very difficult for you to do male voices. I might have pulled it off. I don't know. I haven't listened to it, so I, don't, I won't do that. Because I don't have a computer, so I can't... <laughs> I don't ever watch. I, don't, I just live in the here and now. <laughs> um, I think you think we open it up to questions. Oh, you yeah, yeah. want to ask some questions? For, okay, okay, well, very good. Uh, if you just want to come up to the mic, because um, we want to be able to hear the question. Was there ever a time with your co co-stars that you wanted to just kick them or drive a dagger in their side or something, that they did something? <laughs> Never with Mike. That's interesting, isn't it, actually, when I think about it? Never with Mike. Sometimes with Fraser. Yeah, <laughs> Fraser would be on that list. Somewhere. I have to tell you, because he, you know, he, would, he came on in and he, he didn't have any humility. 
you know, he was so bumptious. He was like, you know, when you're at school and you've got one little kid who's just completely bumptious and full of themselves. So Mike and I used to tease him and put him down. We did. <laughs> I mean, we're such dear friends now. And he doesn't mind. He knows that we, we talk about this. I mean, Mike and I, when we were doing that cape on that train journey up to the first thing, Mike said, oh, my God, you know he's only written a book. Yeah, it's called Phillies of Fe Females and Phillies or something. And we said, oh, typical. You know, so we, we love teasing him. We never... Oh, we did tease Pat. You know the story, don't you, of the T-shirt? You know? yeah. Do you want to hear the tell story? It again, tell tell it again. again. Okay. So after... By the time we got to um, episode six of The Power of the Daleks... Now we're kind of relaxing and we know that Patrick is doing really well and he's happy in the role and we're happy playing with him and we think, okay, now is the time to tease him a little because um, he, he was a great prankster himself. So we thought, all right, we'll get one back on him. So off I went. You couldn't do it in those days. I had to go all the way to Carnaby Street and go to a shop which printed T-shirts and so we, pr we had these T-shirts carefully printed out and it was all secret and then and the crew all knew but Patrick didn't and so then it was finished and they said okay studio that's a that's a wrap we're finished off to the pub <laughs> and um the TARDIS and somebody had said oh uh, pa Pat hang on something in the TARDIS there and the door opened and Pat and Mike and I came out with our t-shirts doing a little and the t-shirt said Come back, Bill Hartwell, all is forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought Patrick would go, oh, brilliant, oh, his little face. <laughs> and he crumbled away, and we realised our little Jake had fallen completely flat. It took, I think it took a couple of bottles of whiskey to get him to come and be our friend again. <laughs> Oh, the boss. The boss wants a question. Hi. <laughs> Annika, I was wondering if you could magically help Philip Morris uncover one of your missing stories in Nigeria elsewhere, which of your missing stories would you choose for him to recover? To be recovered? Yeah, if you could just get one to come back. Well, I mean, in a way, and we're going to have the animation of... Um, the power of the Daleks, but in a way it would be nice to see it for real because this was the moment, I think, you know and in a way that's the turning point I mean it's great we're going to have the animation and but it's going to be an animation you know, so it would be lovely to see Patrick, and when you say my stories, it's really about him it, you know um, you know coming into the role um, because he gave it everything he had, you know. I mean, later on, um, he's so relaxed in the role. But but this in this moment, he, he he's bringing everything he can as a human being, as an actor, and everything to you know to make it work. So I think that it has a real vibration, which you're not going to go to an animation, no, you're not really. So I think it would be that one. Because in a way, as Doctor Who fans, all of us, that would be the most important. Does the BBC give you any warning when something has been discovered because they're going to contact you for uh, commentary or, or whatnot, or do you find out on the news like the rest of us that <laughs> they found something? <laughs> no, luckily I've got mates watching. I've got, I've, I've got a bloke who looks after... I've got an angel who <laughs> runs my website, Matt. He looks after Louise Jameson too. And um, so he always lets me know, so, you know, I do hear. Um, but the, the BBC, you know, i, I tell you one time was... Um, when it was off air, and a young PA, and she said, um, "We're going to get all you, all you Doctor Who, all you Doctor Who people together um, to do a little something." I said, "Oh yeah." She said, "So I mean, I, I'm not sure. This was '98, I think." She said, I'm, "I'm not sure. I've got a list." She didn't know anything about it at all. She said, "I've got, I've got a list." Um, so, you know, would it be... I said, you know, we're a family, it's fine, you know, just call them all up, you know, that you can get hold of, because, you know, we'd love to get together, it'd be nice, you know, because we all know each other's children and everything. So so then she gets back to me, and I said, oh, how are you doing? Have you have you managed... She said, yes, I've managed to contact most people. I just... I haven't heard back from, uh, let me see, uh, John Pertwee and uh, Michael... and Patrick Troughton. 
I said, do your homework, darling, they're dead. <laughs> So, you know, the BBC are not, you know... But now that money can be made, now they're actually, you know, listening and watching. With the release of so many of your... D- on DVDs specifically, have you noticed that a uh, fan reaction uh, or fan mindset change about Polly? Have you, have you gotten more appreciation for your character because of all the releases that have come out? I don't know. Matt hasn't told me. I'll have to... Go. <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I just do it and enjoy it, you know. And also we're getting really good writers. Um, and actually, that no, you, it must be, because um, David Richardson, producer, said, we're having amazing feedback. People are really enjoying Polly and Ben, you know, coming back. So that we've got more on, on this. On, so it must be good. Do you find a lot of young fans come up to you at conventions and, that surprise you that maybe they recognize who you are? It just completely blows me away. You know, and also, of course, we're in the time when there isn't. So, you know, so when there there isn't something to feed off, then they're going to go back. And I love that. I was ooh, in somewhere, I can't remember. And I'm leaning over the balcony. of People coming into the hotel. I thought, wait a minute, there's something familiar about that. This sort of funny little hatty, baker's boy hatty, in a stripy shirt. Oh my God, she's me! <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first time I've ever seen anybody dressed as Polly. That was amazing. I went rushing down and said, Oi, come on, let's take pictures together. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite thing about meeting the fans when uh, you come to conventions? What's, what, what are the things that you like the best about meeting and greeting the public? Well, I think our shared enthusiasm about the show. And, um, of course, you see... Oh, dear. Now I have to confess. Uh, funny how you have to do that. It's almost like sitting up here, you know, it's like a confessional. <laughs> oh! I have to say, I don't understand the new show. I sit there, I'm all keen, I think, I bet. After a few minutes, I think, oh, I don't... I don't know what's going on. Actually, Foyle's War is on the other side, and it's so good. I think I'll watch that instead. (laughs) So I haven't watched a lot of the new show, I have to say. I think it's too tricky, and I also have a judgment, because I think if people, if you have characters that can simply die and have a terrible death, and the next minute they're coming back because they've reformed themselves or something, I think, well, where's the drama now? I don't don't know. So, um, so I've rather lost the plot there. So, so when, when I meet up with the lovely fans who love our era, you know, then, then it's very exciting. And then I'm in, the, I'm in the seats with you guys listening to people like Omega, you know, do his voice. And I'm then, because I'm a fan. <laughs> when, when I, when I oh God, you get me going, it's awful. I drive my son mad because this is, you know, we both do it. So um, <laughs> when I went to do that first ever, and they said, you know, what, uh, what, you know, what about Doctor Who? Blah, 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 I said, well, I have to admit to you, actually, um, I'm a Star Trek fan. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were going to, you know, they were going to, you know, stone me. <laughs> but you know, so so when I wasn't watching Doctor Who, I was watching First Generation. I have my little badge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you were there when Patrick met Frazier for the first time, and they're famous for being pranksters. Did they ever really get you guys? Did they really prank? Did, when, when did you see that prankster uh, thing start with those two? The friendship. Well, yeah, and they were famous for pranking people on the set. Oh, right. Oh, did, for they really, did they ever get you? For being naughty. And yeah, I know. So that that was interesting because that was that didn't happen till I left because <laughs> I wouldn't have let that happen. <laughs> I'd have been on to him like a ton of bricks. So um, it was you know it was once Auntie Annika had left you know then the two boys. I mean, in a way, you see it in the faceless ones because I've just done a commentary for the faceless ones, and um, you know they kind of brusquely sort of say, oh, well, we're back in 1966, so enjoy, guys. Yeah, cheers, yeah. Off they trot. And you watch the two of them. You know, Fraser's little kilt is going like this, and, and Patrick's saying, well, I think I left the TARDIS over here. And off they go without a backward glance. Disloyal buggers, you know. And they you know, there's me and Mike standing there crying, actually. We were crying, and we were crying, because this is the end of our time in Doctor Who. 
Um, and that was filmed in the beginning. Um, so, so, yeah, so the two of them, like little... So in a way, um, Fraser influenced Pat because he brought out the little boy in Pat, you see. And, um, yeah, so the two of them were off to have little adventures and new girls. <laughs> <laughs> I never watched it again. <laughs> Other questions? That was his revenge for your shirt. Say it? That was his revenge revenge for for your shirt. You and Michael doing the shirts. uh, uh, When you pranked uh, Patrick. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but Patrick was, also I want to tell you, because he also was a very deeply mystical man, Patrick. He had a whole side to him where he was fascinated um, by spirituality. And he was a painter. So he, he was a fascinating man. My husband got a bit jealous because, you know, I really, I really liked him. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm telling you everything. Stop me, otherwise you're going to know everything. <laughs> As I say, I don't mind. I don't care. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Yes, come, come, because I'm a bit deaf. So you have to be really... And then I want to ask you, anybody comes across an antique ear trumpet, please send it to me. I want a brass one with a little, so I can say, what? You said what? You said what? <coughs> Hello, sweetheart. I'm a big fan of Patrick Johnson. I love to watch all of his episodes. And sometimes when I see a companion leave, I think to myself, I see another one. I wish that companion would have been this one. So my question is, um, which Patrick Thompson story would you have loved to be in to be after in. the faceless ones? Ah, well, now you've got me on a spot because I haven't actually watched. I, that's interesting. I, so here we go. Because when I stopped being in the show, I stopped watching it. I was thinking about that this morning. It's like... If you've lived in a house and then you have to leave it, do you go back and look at that house? No, you don't, because that was a place you lived in. Now somebody else is living in it, so you don't. It's like a relationship. If you've moved along from a relationship, you don't want to go back and revisit that, do you? Somebody else is there in your place. So, and that was what it was like with Doctor Who, and also because my children were little and it was bath time at half past five on a Saturday afternoon. So, So it wasn't convenient to watch, but also there was that sort of uncomfortable feeling that you know you weren't in it anymore um, and we were busy okay then we, we went to the country and in my wisdom I decided we wouldn't have a telly at all because I wanted my children just to be in the country and not to be sitting watching telly, they got one in the end um, um, my son was watching Doctor Who but I didn't he, he now, he's 50, he told me Davros was my favourite. <laughs> so he was watching Doctor Who. Um, so I never, I never watched it. Now, um, I'm never in a situation, if anybody's got some Patrick Troughton for me to watch, I'd love to watch it. I'm definitely going to go and try and see if I can see what Omega is like. He sounds wonderful. So, you know, I've got more homework to do. But to tell you the truth, I really only do it, I only watch my stuff because I'm going to come and talk to you guys. I want to remember it again. So I can't answer your question, sweetheart. Send me some perfect... Which one would you say was the best story of Patrick's to watch? Thank all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hey! So there you go. We hope you enjoyed that. And again, a charming lady, and we, we had so much fun. In fact... After the panel, I kept occasionally going by and saying hi and talking to her at her table. <laughs> I went and got my autograph afterwards, and she she thanked us or thanked me for being such a delight on the panel and and how much she enjoyed just doing that alone. And That's always encouraging to us because when oh, yeah. we get up there and we do these things, you know, you always feel self conscious about doing it. It's not about us; it's about the guest. But we want to make sure that we're giving them. And putting them in the best light, and it's always nice to hear that feedback from them saying, "Oh, I had so much fun." And she's so there. so go with the flow. She's she, she she's kind of mentioned along the, along to, the lines of she's easy. Yeah, it's to kind get of those it's, it's great being with pe- some people that were laid back and excited about what was going on. And yeah, I got a hug. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a hug after the after the panel. Um, so we're done. We're like, okay, we we had three yesterday. 
two today, we're done. We're done. We're good. We can relax. We can, we can enjoy relax. the rest of the con. We can maybe get some so interviews or as something. as we go back to our table to put our... Because we keep we keep holding this banner back and forth and had it on the stage with us every time. And it looked great. And we go back, and as we're setting the banner up, Sean's going, come here, come here, come here. He's down there talking to Kieran. And I thought, oh, I, I wonder if he's asking how the panel went. Or, or yeah. I walk up there, and <laughs> Sean goes... We're going to do the uh, Peter Davidson panel today again. Like, well, I, I said, how would you feel about doing the, the Peter oh, panel? Was, yeah. And, and you, I went, Peter who? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, okay. My brain. Yeah, I mean, Keith was there. He asked, he says, would you guys, and, you know, I looked at Keith and we were like, yeah. Twist our <laughs> arm. Ask, ask us twice. Well, we should probably run it by Glenn. Glenn, come here. Would you, you be okay with doing the Peter panel? If Peter he, who? He was say no, I was going to be like, all right, Sean, and I will do it. My <laughs> brain had shut down. I was done. I had, was Con responsibility was over. I had completely shut down. And you went, can you do the Peter panel? I went, Peter who? And, I, I, and now, to be fair, I went, oh, Davison? <laughs> because then it struck me. We get to do Peter Davison again? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. We had to do Peter. Yeah. So that's just my favorite moment from today. <laughs> Peter who? Peter who? Back in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, and I know you know who it is. In I the know front of my is. mind, I'm thinking, we get to talk to Peter again. We get another hour with Peter again. And in the back of my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, this is our third panel this week, our sixth panel, sixth panel together. today. Uh, so, so we said, yeah, absolutely. We said, yeah, and so. We didn't have a lot of time, but did we go eat before this time, or did we? We nope. did. No. No. We, 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 we had an. We, we had. Have, we had an hour. We had an hour. Yeah. We only had an hour at that. Didn't point. make it. And so I think we hit the vendor room again, and uh, I don't. It's, it's such a blur. Relaxed, I don't even. Yeah. I think we did. We just kind of relaxed. I we went and got hour. my Peter autograph. That's right. And picked know. up my photo from the uh, the, the the photo that, op. That was when I got my Annika autograph. That's right. Um, so after that, we went back in there, and then I had this moment of, I don't know what we're going to talk about because I, I that my, the biggest thing is when they do these panels, you have to expect that there are probably people that weren't in there because they said, oh, he's got a panel on Sunday, I'll go to that. But you also don't want to do a complete recap of the yeah. of everything that you did because there's going to be people that w- coming in there looking for more information. Unless it's Galley and you have one of the unless the, it's billed that way you know the big things well, and they warn you in advance we're doing two panels one saturday one sunday they're going to be nearly identical because we want to try and get as many people right, into because, them as possible because Pick galley one. once the room okay. fills up unless you're standing you're not going to get in yeah room. yeah so and and so uh, that i fully get but at another con it's like oh well it's going to be a different panel because it's a different day you yeah. know hopefully so we rotated out put keith on point on that <laughs> who started us out with i thought a wonderful question that we didn't Thank get to you. the day before <laughs> Uh, which was the five doctors, and yeah. uh, as you as as you listened earlier, you, a lot of this is going to be recap for you too, because like I say, we've put both of those panels kind of together to make one big panel, so that uh, you can get all the all the the goodness that. And, and this time we got Peter two had. audience questions, which were fantastic we did. questions. Yes, yeah, that was the nice thing is to have the audience be able to, because uh, it felt so bad that we had taken up <laughs> so much of that time. Of course, I think we ask a lot of the questions people would ask anyway, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it wasn't intentional. No, I mean, it wasn't. It, 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 we, we apologize if you were in there going, I had this burning question and I didn't get to ask it. It wasn't that we wanted to do that. It just He's he's such a good storyteller and so easy is. to talk to that the yeah. hour definitely got away from, from him and certainly from us as well. Absolutely. Just kind of riding that wave of, yeah, tell us another story. And, <laughs> and again, very gracious with his stories and very gracious with us. And it was it was a lot of fun. I just had a blast. Oh, yes. Um, after that was over, that's when we decided to go. Well, you and Sarah, Sarah was Sarah was, well. was, was feeling pretty tired. She yeah. hadn't slept well the last two nights, really. So And so you guys decided to head back. And unfortunately... After all of that, we didn't get a chance to speak with Wars for saying we wanted to so bad. But by the time that was over, there was so much booking that was going on as far as panels and things like that. We just couldn't get to it. But we had <laughs> attempted because we wanted to, we wanted to hear from Jonathan Peel, who was who's the author of Grandfather uh, Infestation in the Lethbridge Stewart line. And clearly, uh, he's done other stuff, even within Doctor Who comics and some books. He's written uh, some novelizations, he wrote uh, a new adventure series. Uh, story and some missing a uh, missing adventure story, so we were really excited to talk to John. Unfortunately, when we got back. John was booked all the way till the end of the day. He was there doing was a lot nothing. of moderating. So what we have done is we have uh, made contact uh, with him. We got his contact information. We're going to bring you that later. We, uh, he's uh, been gracious enough to agree to an interview that we'll do at a later date, and we will get to that. So. I imagine if you went to a panel at uh, 
at Time Eddy this weekend, you probably saw it moderated by John. There's a good chance. Or us. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's, that's certainly what, what it felt like. like. Because for the most part, these the uh, guest panels were, for the most part, moderated by either John or us. Uh, I don't think there were many other uh, of the... Of and the, not that we were yeah. complaining at all. No, not, yeah, at, all. not at all. In fact, that was the thing is... Uh, that was one of the things I loved about this convention well, was the fact that on we the got one to... side, if I had gone to a convention and moderated six panels, and I we really only moderated five because one of them was a quiz show, but that's exhausting in itself. <laughs> that's a whole different exhaustion. If I'd have gone to any other one, I I think I would have felt kind of just like, oh, I'm done. I'm glad it's over. It was even after that sixth panel on the second day, it was well, like, third right, panel, second day, sixth now? panel overall. It was a, you know, I could do this another two two or three hours. I could do another two or three panels. And it's because of that atmosphere. It's because of who we got to talk to. And I think it was a wonderful thing to be able to reach out and, and help out Kieran and, and Lisa, who organized a phenomenal Absolutely wonderful. con this year. I'm so glad that they did it again uh, for a second year. Uh, we are looking forward to its return, uh, whenever that may be. Uh, again, as we said, it took off. But we want to uh, we want to thank... Uh, both of them especially for uh, involving us in this and for allowing us to get the access yeah. that we did um, again they put on a wonderful show I couldn't tell every there was nobody complaining there you every once in a while you, you walk around a con and you hear you know everybody seems to have a good time and I think overall they're a success but occasionally you hear grumbles you know you hear somebody says oh I didn't go to anything this didn't this didn't work out for me I can't believe they did this not a one in yeah, this one no everybody complaints. was having a good time um, there was no complaints, at least visual, visibly. There was nobody having any issues. Um, it just overall was a good con, and they continue to put on a, an excellent show. It was it. excellent last year, and they would overcome whatever small stumbling blocks they yeah. ran into yeah, last yeah. year Absolutely. and and expanded it and put on an even bigger and better show this year. Yeah. Um, and it ran so smoothly, and I, we can't it's, stress enough how good a show. If you're in the area and a Doctor Who fan you need to come yeah. if you're not in the area you need to find it's a way well to get down here from new mexico. Hey, come on yeah, yeah. people come from new mexico California last year that's and the nice thing is it's in the midwest it is there's i mean like i've i've lamented for years and years and years that there's nothing nearby you have to go to california you have to go to chicago you have to go to new york you have to go to alabama it, there's something central for us that's that's doctor who specific don't get me wrong I, I, we have conventions around us but having a doctor who convention in the midwest is wonderful, and I'm glad that there's somebody that's picked up the the uh, torch and run with that. And doing so. such a good job with it. Yeah. Uh, so we can't thank them enough. Uh, as Sean alluded to earlier, if you have come to the show uh, because of Time Eddie, welcome. Uh, we do this on a weekly basis, and uh, we hope you continue to listen and enjoy this. Uh, they're not all like this episode. This was a little special <laughs> because it was a recap of the con, and if you came here because of the con, you've probably heard all this. <laughs> uh, but hopefully we regaled you with some fun. Um, is there anything else you guys want to talk about the the con before we close it out? I think we'll uh, we'll do the usual. Uh, I don't think so. I, don't I, think, I so. think we've we've hit on all the high notes, and I, I didn't have any low ones. So yeah, just thank you again, Kieran, and enjoy your much deserved break. Time off, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Um, if you want to support us on this podcast, you can go to our website, travelingtovortex.com. We have a link to Patreon. Uh, it'll walk you through how to get set up. And as always, if you're already a Patreon uh, sub- supporter, thank you so very much. Um, we are on the uh, various uh, social media as well. You can find us, which Keith? Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, as we mentioned. And uh, hopefully you saw a bunch of our Instagram pictures yeah. from the convention. So be sure to follow us there. And, uh, Sean, do you want to talk about what's coming up on the schedule? Well, coming up next week on the schedule, uh, again, if you're new to the show, we do a thing called Friday Night Who. Didn't go off so well this week, but that's <laughs> con-related. Um, every, Apologies. Yeah, every every week we get together that. and we, we uh, do a, a virtual tweet-along. Or uh, It's not a virtual. It's, it's an actual um, tweet-along. An actual tweet-along with a virtual <laughs> watch-along. Virtual Basically, watch-along, yeah. we, we all queue up an episode of Doctor Who every week at Friday night at midnight, and we watch it, and then we tweet along, and so you get live commentary, basically. It's a lot of fun. We encourage you to uh, tune in if you can. This week is The Caretaker, which is probably why I kept uh, saying that with Peter Capaldi in uh, preparation for our show next week, which is going to be all about class. Um, we are doing a companion uh, archive. archive on Coal Hill School, where a lot of the action has been centered over uh, in the Doctor Who universe. And the premiere of class is this week. 
Uh, so we will be reviewing the pilot. As I believe it's a two-parter. It so is a two-parter, yeah. We'll be reviewing that as our actual review content for next week, uh, along with uh, a comic and a short story that feature Coal Hill School. Mm-hmm. The comic is called uh, The Monsters of Coal Hill School, mm-hmm. and uh, it was found in the 2014 Doctor Who Annual. And then we are doing one called um, so, uh, Nothing at the End of the la- Lane, which is a short story in the... Um, Short trips and side, uh, short trips and sidesteps. Uh, short trips and sidesteps. Uh, novel or a group it's of an stories, anthology. Anthology of stories. So, uh, and I think that can still be found uh, in places. So, so your homework assignment, if you'd like to follow along, uh, is that. But otherwise, we'll be uh, we'll be talking about that. So, plan on some spoilers if you haven't seen class. Obviously, next week, uh, and the rest of the schedule is, of course, available on our website. Absolutely. If that's going to do it for this week, until next week, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Happy 300! Yay! Yay! You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied.